Unity of all submitters, 262. Surely those who believe, those who are Jewish, the Christians, and the converts, anyone who, one, believes in God, and two, believes in the last day, and three, leads a righteous life, will receive their recompense from their Lord. They have nothing to fear, nor will they grieve. Covenant with Israel. We made a covenant with you as he raised Mount Sinai above you. You shall uphold what we have given you strongly and remember its contents, that you may be saved. But you turned away thereafter and if it... oh, someone else took over. Uh, but you turned away thereafter and if it were not for God's grace towards you and his mercy, you would have been doomed. You have known about those among you who desecrated the Sabbath. We said to them, be you as despicable as apes. We set them up as an example for their uh, generation, as well as subsequent generations, and an enlightenment for the righteous. Thank you. Um, I had a comment about 62. This is a famous verse that we bring up. Okay, I guess I can't give my comments. Yeah, so what my comment is about 262. And so this is the verse we talk about. It's the unity of all submitters. I just want to give a very simplistic explanation of this verse. Inshallah. So basically the concept is this. We are all born with the instinctive knowledge to worship God alone. That's in 3030, right? Let me put the verse here. Okay, so it says, Therefore you shall devote yourself to the religion of strict monotheism, such as a natural instinct placed into the people by God. Such creation of God will never change. This is the perfect religion, but most people do not know. So in line with this, there are natural instinct to worship God alone. That coincides with what we're talking about in 262. When we're talking about having unity among all submitters, when it comes to Jews, Christians, converts, and anyone who believe, and anyone who has these three things, believes in God, believes in the last day, believes in the righteous life, right? So a lot of people get stuck on this to say, well, what do you mean? You know, can't we just condemn people that don't do a lot like us? And the answer is no, because everyone's at different stages. Right? So we're talking about people that are born into a Christian family, are born into a Buddhist family, are born into what n nothing, no religion, but they are holding on to their natural instinct of worshiping God alone. So by doing that, then they fall into the same category as us, as submitters to God. And we are responsible for what we know. So then the question is, okay, what does it mean to be righteous? In the general sense, we have an idea of what righteousness, what, what, what righteousness entails. But once we get uh, exposed to more information, then our responsibility increases. And within the context of the Quran, that was the verse I was about to put, it's 2177, then the concept of righteousness is more clearly defined with more specific details. Then, as followers in the Quran, we are to uphold it to the fullest extent uh, possible for us. So just to reiterate what I'm saying, this is a paragraph I took from Appendix 1. It says, while every religion has been corrupted by innovations, traditions, and, fa and false idolatrous doctrines, there may be submitters within every religion. There may be submitters who are Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, or anything else. These submitters collectively constitute the only religion acceptable to God. As emphasized by the theme on the front page of this book, all submitters... Are who are devoted to God alone and do not set up any idols beside God are redeemed into God's eternal kingdom. 262, that's the verse we read. A criterion of the true submitters is that they will find nothing objectionable in the Quran. That's what it comes down to. So you have this general concept of submission in terms of your natural instinct. You rely on that. You are a submitter. You can be a submitter in any background. Then you come to the Quran and because of the blessing God has bestowed upon you, you also don't find anything objectionable in the Quran. And you continue with that concept of submission, but it gets refined and defined within the context of the scripture. This is what unifies us. Oh, thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments on that issue or any other the other verses? Just uh, pasted uh, three verses in the from the Quran. So... Uh, to tack on from your point, basically, this requirements, believe in God, believe in the hereafter, lead a righteous life, it's going to vary by degree of, uh, you know, knowledge, information, uh, uh, access we have. 
uh, meaning that someone today who has access to the full Quran can read it in their own language. Uh, they're going to be held at a higher responsibility than someone who, again, doesn't have the scripture and uh, has to uh, off their own, um, you know, uh, they put it instinctive knowledge, come to the same conclusion. Uh, each of us are going to be held responsible based on what we have. Uh, that said, I mean, us, we have the Quran. God in the Quran gives us uh, three verses that explain what it means to, to believe in the hereafter. Uh, the first one is 6113, and this is in the context of, it says, uh, the previous verse, it says, uh, the devil's uh, allied, um, inspired them, uh, individuals through fancy words in order to deceive. Uh, and then in 6113, it says, this is to let the minds of those who do not believe in the hereafter listen to such fabrications and accept them and thus expose their real convictions. And that if we have the Quran, we claim we accept it, but then we fall another source, this is actually indicative that we don't believe in the hereafter. Uh, the other one is 1745 through 46 is when you read the Quran, we place between you and those who do not believe in the hereafter an invisible barrier. We place shields around their minds to prevent them from understanding it and deafness in their ears. And when you preach your Lord using the Quran alone, they run away in aversion. In that if we're uh, uh, apprehensive to following the Quran alone, the worship of God alone, and again, it's a sign that we don't believe in the hereafter. And the uh, last verse is 3945. But it says, when God alone, Allah Wahdahu, is mentioned, the hearts of those who do not believe in the hereafter shrink with aversion. But when others are mentioned beside him, they become satisfied. And this is another sign that if we're not satisfied with la 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 la, you know, mentioning the God uh, alone in our uh, worship practices, in our salat, and it's also a sign that we don't believe in the hereafter. Okay, for everyone who just joined, we read from 262 in the Quran to... 266 and from 263 to 266 that we read it covers the covenant with israel uh take a moment to think about those verses if there are no further questions we can continue uh, um, go ahead i'll make one other comment regarding uh, 63 so it says we made a covenant with you as we raise mount sinai above you you shall uphold what we have given you strongly and remember its contents that you may be saved um, if you look into the uh, modern translation of the Bible, you won't find this event where basically Mount Sinai was lifted above uh, the uh, children of Israel as if it's an umbrella. But one thing that was uh, I found out um, listening to a rabbi, actually, he was saying that the word that's used in the Bible for this event uh, is basically, it's typically translated, oh, at the foot of the uh, the, the, the the mountain, but it also means underneath. And uh, I just pasted an article kind of going into those uh, details. It's really interesting. You know, this is one of the, the, the facets of the Quran is that it clarifies and it settles these aspects that, again, were either concealed or locked up uh, in the Bible. Um, and it kind of shows how the Quran supersedes the uh, previous scriptures. Okay. I loaded the next set of verses. Do we have a volunteer to come up and read these verses? Imani, do you want to come up? Can you come up, please, and read these verses? Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Sharing children. I loaded them for you, uh, mm -hmm. 67 to 271. Would you be able to read them, please? Yes. I also got the footnote. Go ahead. All right. Tells me the heifer. Moses said to his people, God commands you to sacrifice a heifer. They said, Are you mocking us? He said, God forbid that I should behave like the ignorant ones. They said, Call upon your Lord to show us which one. He said, He says that she is a heifer that is neither too old nor too young, of an intermediate age. Now carry out what you are commanded to do. They said, Call upon your Lord to show us her color. He said, He says she, that, blah. He says that she is a yellow heifer, bright colored, but pleases the beholders. They said, Call upon your Lord to show us which one. The heifers look alike to us, and God willing, we will be guided. He said, He says that she is a heifer that was never humiliated in plowing the land or watering the crops, free from any blemish. They said, Now you have brought the truth. They finally sacrificed her after this lengthy reluctance. 
Praise God. I, thank you so much. And can you read the footnote? I put it here. Mm -hmm. Footnote for verse 67. Although the surah contains important laws and commandments, including the contact prayers, fasting, hajj pilgrimage, and the laws of marriage, divorce, etc., the name given to this surah is the heifer. This reflects the crucial importance of submission to God and immediate, unwavering obedience to our Creator. Such submission proves our belief in God's omnipotence and absolute authority. See also the Bible's Book of Numbers, chapter 19. Thank you. Um, so Jamal asked a question. I can just answer it real quick. He asked, why do we uh, read footnotes? Um, is this tafsir study or Quran study? No, I think it's both. I mean, I think it's, I think it's, uh, we're, we're studying the Quran, right? Because if we're going to say that we're not allowed to give comments, then we shouldn't be sitting here talking with each other, right? We should all just read the Quran. But the fact of the matter is, I'm giving my opinion, you're giving your opinion, people are giving their opinion, so I don't see any problem with seeing the opinion of God's messenger. I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, but it seems like it's not that someone is bringing up like a commentary or something, but it's just like uh, as, a, as an addition to Quran, which should be a little bit problematic then. It's, it's like uh, adding uh, Muhammad's name to, to Allah in the mosque, you know? Uh, I don't see it like that. I don't see it the same way at all. Okay. Let's not do these debates here right now. Yeah. Um, but I did want to say about Can this I... topic. But Can I say to something? something? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, if the Rashad says like that, uh, then he will put the side notes in the Quran. I think that uh, it's not like bringing up Muhammad's name in Salat. It's more like learning his opinion about the verses. It's not shirk. If it's yeah. not shirk, Rashad wouldn't put it, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, but let's talk about the content of it. Actually, instead of considering it shirk, let's actually see what it's saying. So actually, I think this point is right. And we could talk about what it means. But basically, I agree with this, that there are, chapter two is the longest sewer, right? And it covers many, many, many topics. And the concept of the story is, look, why are you asking all these questions about uh, the heifer? What, what, how old should she be? The color, this and that. It's like, God says a commandment. We should just say we hear and we obey. And we should be begging for more commandments because commandments are blessing from, from God. We say, look, sign me up. Whatever commandments there are, I'd love to hear more of them because I would love to obey them. Right? So th this is the whole concept. The children of Israel, they were not at that point. They were asking too many questions. And so we say we hear and we obey. You know, God says, don't do this. I say, I hear and obey. God says, you know, whatever. The interim period of married couples, whatever, is four months. I say, okay, it's four months. It's not three months. It's not five months. Ramadan is during whatever. The, uh, uh, fasting is during Ramadan. I say, I hear and I obey. And there's, this is the longest surah, so it is correct that all these topics are covered in this chapter, and this topic is coming up. So this reflects our submission. And what do we mean by being submitters? It means that we truly submit to God. But the opposite of that is to say, no, I'm not going to accept what God is teaching me. I'm going to change it, twist it, and come up with other meanings and interpretations and you know, other non-godly, I guess, uh, viewpoints. So then, then at that point, we're not really submitting to God, we're submitting to our ego. I think this is the whole point of this, um, the lesson of the story. Yeah, you see this uh, theme uh, repeated, you know, uh, from what we read even uh, last week. Uh, Moses gives certain commands and then the people object. Uh, they say they want to see God physically. They say they refuse to enter the gate humbly. Uh, they say that they uh, are tired of the, the, the man and quails that God gave them. And it's like every time if they just, you know, said, okay, we hear and we obey, uh, it would just be easier on them. Uh, the whole matter would be resolved. But it's this aspect that they constantly want, you know, uh, more and more uh, clarification um, than what God gave to them. Like when God tells us in Surah 2 verse 3, the believers are those who observe their contact person a lot. 
Now, the aspect is, okay, if God is telling us this is something we need to do, we have to assume that we have the information we need to get the job done. Um, and it's the same thing here. God is telling them, hey, sacrifice a heifer. And, you know, they're, they're questioning Moses. You mocking us? Why do you want us to do this? What's the point, you know? And it's uh, just this human tendency to be uh, dissatisfied with kind of what uh, God has uh, uh, instructed us to do. Yeah, so like um, there was probably like if they uh, obeyed instantly and just slaughtered any like a normal call, their command would be considered uh, completed, right? But instead, they uh, asked for more de more and more details and complicated the uh, the fulfillment of the command to themselves to the point where it's nearly impossible to 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 find such a thing. So um, I think the lesson of the ayahs might be that uh, we shouldn't ask for more details that, than we are already provided. Okay. So can we find like some orders uh, in Islam where people actually searched for more details and explanations on how to do something? Yeah, that's what Hadith is, right? Hadith is a book in which you find anything you want. It covers like all these ridiculous situations that the people are asking these questions that you're talking about. I think, you know, a big aspect, there's a difference between information and uh, religious uh, uh, laws. Um, you know, when it comes to information, the world is replete with places that we can find information. We go and study biology, we study the origins of life, we study the cosmos, you know. These are information that, in essence, is going to strengthen our faith. We're not going to be looking at these other sources for uh, religious, uh, you know, laws and guidance. Uh, all that information, you know, is embedded uh, inside the, uh, the, 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 the Quran. Again, if, if God gives us a command, the aspect is we should be, unless he gives us the details, the expectation is, okay, we should be, we have enough information to carry out what we need to do. Um, and that's the, the, the takeaway that I have is that these people, in essence, they're saying, no, you know, uh, it's really, it's a reluctance. They don't want to do it, so they're trying to create an excuse. Because in the uh, the verse it says they almost didn't do it, um, that they thought that Moses was like mocking them by asking this. And you think about this, you know, how many people, when God says, "Hey, do your salat," and you're like, "Okay, well, the salat is, you know, uh, bowing, prostrating, putting your forehead on the ground," and people mock and ridicule it. Uh, they say, "Oh, you guys are, you know, uh, worshiping a, a black cube and this and that," and it's just because it doesn't make sense to them. And you know, when God tells us, for instance, don't eat uh, the the meat of pigs. And someone says, well, what about, you know, uh, they want to prohibit also the fat or, you know, oh, well, look, this applied only in the past when pigs were unclean. Today, they're sanitary. You know, it's just this questioning of God's uh, judgment as if God wasn't aware of kind of what the uh, situation was going to be, you know, when he issued these uh, uh, commandments. I'm going to link to a, an article uh, which is interesting regarding this concept of uh, sacrificing the heifer. Um, to, to paraphrase in the, uh, the, the, the Bible, this uh, requirement is basically uh, uh, instituted when someone is found dead uh, without a, uh, like basically outside of the boundaries of uh, where people uh, uh, had uh, uh, cities and communities. And it was a mechanism to decipher uh, where this person, you know, who from which city uh, murdered this uh, individual. I just think this is uh, interesting.
All right, dude, do you want to read this next set of verses? From which uh, verse? I just put it in VC1. 72? Yeah. As, uh, you had killed a soul then disputed among yourselves. God was to expose uh, what you tried to conceal. We said, strike the victim with part of the heifer. That is when God brought the victim back to life and showed you his signs that you may understand. Despite this, your hearts harden like rocks or even harder, for there are rocks from which rivers gush out. Others crack and release gentle streams, and other rocks cringe out of reverence for God. God is never unaware of anything you do. Distorting the word of God. At 275, do you expect them to believe as you do when some of them used to hear the word of God, then distort it with full understanding thereof and deliberately? Uh, concealing the word of God, sort of 2, 276, uh, 276. When they meet the believers, they say, we believe. When they get together with each other, they say, do not inform the believers of the information given to you by God, lest you provide them with support for their argument concerning your Lord. Do not understand. Do they not know that God knows everything they conceal and everything they declare? So I think, did you miss a verse? I think you didn't. Did you read 275? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, any questions or comments about these verses? So I wanted to talk about 275. So this is the story in the Word of God. It says, do you expect them to believe as you do when some of them used to hear the Word of God, then distort it with full understanding thereof and deliberately? How evil is that when you know God's word and you distort it, let's say for personal reasons, right? Or let's say you want control or power, or you want domination, or you have some interest that's being advanced by distorting the word of God. We have to be very careful about that. Um, and we have to realize how evil that kind of thing is. How do you guys understand uh, 274 when it, it gives this uh, example? It says, your hearts harden like rocks or even harder. There are rocks from which rivers gush out, others crack and release gentle streams, and other rocks cringe out of reverence for God. God is never unaware of anything you do. More specifically, it's that that last group, the the ones that uh, cringe out of uh, uh, reverence, to God. Like, what does that constitute? Who, which hearts are those? All right, so. Basically, a hardened heart is one that is uh, closed to the message, to God's um, God's truth. Um, so when your hearts are hardened, nothing gets through. This is the concept. This is the allegory. I think is being applied here. When you have a, when you have an open heart, then you're receptive to God's message. But when you have a closed heart or a hardened heart, it's not going to get through. So then God says that even there's rocks that come, that basically they're hard, but even they have cracks within them that water can get through. And here's the allegory of the message getting through. So it says for there are rocks. So they're harder than rocks because they're rocks which rivers gush out, the water gets through. So this is like a curse to not be able to get God's message. I have a, a way I understand this. It's a, 
we basically have you know the the hearts that gush out of reverence for god are people who instantly they hear god's message they fall prostrate uh, they they recognize it as if it's their own children and other rocks crack and release gentle streams you know these are individuals at the uh, onset were um uh, not receptive but slowly as the the message seeps in uh, like one of the beauties is if you have this rock and it has its porous water gets into that rock when the water freezes those molecules are going to basically crack that rock uh open um that despite you know the 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 hardness of the rock a tiny bit of water can basically crack it open and then that third category it says but there are uh, uh rocks that basically uh, uh, become hardened, and it says cringe out of reverence for God. The way I understand these rocks, these rocks in essence are ones that kind of collapse in on themselves, because anytime you have a force uh, exerted on, say, a rock, you take a, a star, for instance, as that force increases, um, you're either going to have a supernova where the star explodes, or you have the star collapse in on itself and form a black hole. And I see this almost as if the disbelievers, they're so resistant to God's message. And there's, you know, a uh, axiom that says for every uh, action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That these hearts have been so hardened that under this immense pressure, rather than cracking open or exploding God's message, they actually fall into themselves as a black hole. And one thing that's interesting is if you read Surah uh, 57, uh, verse 13, on the day of uh, um, uh, uh, resurrection, it says, On that day, the hypocrite men and women will say to those who believe, Please allow us to absorb some of your light. It will be said, Go back behind you and seek light. A barrier will be set up between them whose gate separates mercy on the inner side from retribution on the outer side. It's like we think about what we're doing in this life where we're trying to grow and develop our souls. Then some souls, rather than growing and developing, this immense amount of pressure from God is literally going to have them collapse into a black hole and distance themselves even further away from God. And it's just interesting that it says allow us to absorb some of your light because the, the, the premise of the black hole is that nothing escapes this. That this is a, uh, a force that's so great and not even light can escape its uh, pull. No matter how much light is given to a black hole, it's always going to stay black. Yeah, because a black hole actually absorbs all the light. Uh, nothing escapes it. It takes all the life, all light in itself, right? It doesn't give off light. Yeah, and this this is the actually the when you uh, Surah twenty four it talks about the allegory of God's light. And then it gives uh, parables to basically the believers. They radiate God's light. The disbelievers, all they do is they absorb God's light and they never reflect it back. It, God showers them with blessings and appreciate things to be appreciative for. And rather than you know being thankful, uh, you know uh, expressing their uh, uh, appreciation, they just become more and more unappreciative. You know, the the term kafir doesn't mean just disbeliever; it also means unappreciative. It's also a tiller, someone who basically gets seed and covers it with soil. You know, meaning that God is again showering them with all these blessings, all this information, all this you know uh, uh, opportunity to redeem themselves, and rather than you know opening up, uh, sprouting, all they keep doing is just covering up God's blessings as if they they've never received it. There's a Another interesting phenomenon regarding a, a, a black hole is that if someone was to theoretically enter into a black hole, it would be in a, a state of suspended animation for eternity. Or in essence, they wouldn't ever actually enter the black hole. It would be in a state of nothingness. They would have all of eternity and access to every single thing that's ever happened in their life not be able to ever exit that state and when you think about this thought it's like this is you know a, a physics a thought experiment regarding the the entrance of a black hole and you contemplate you say that sounds a lot like hell <laughs> that you know it says uh, uh the believers aren't going to be kind of like uh, uh, earthbound that god describes them like butterflies 
you know, but these uh, the disbelievers, in essence, are going to be in an uh, utter void for all of eternity with nothing to do except to reflect on all the bad decisions they made, all the terrible things that led them to that outcome. I have a, another comment, though, regarding uh, 76. So this is, uh, it says, when they meet the believers, they say, we believe, but when they get together with each other, they say, do not inform the, uh, the believers of the information given to you by God, lest you provide them with support for their argument concerning your Lord. Do not understand. Uh, you know, we see this uh, rampant among uh, the uh, rabbis and scholars of the Old Testament, where they try to hide certain facets point towards like say the uh the hajj pilgrimage uh mecca being uh sorry the kaaba uh being in mecca um that they try to distort this information not to give credence to this religion um there was a, a famous rabbi who said oh yeah we deliberately i remember it was uh, circulating on youtube years ago it says oh yeah we deliberately uh hide things to uh, sever that tie with islam because they don't want to give it any credibility that this is the uh, next continuation of uh, the Abrahamic faiths. And that element just shows that they don't really believe. They're more concerned of preserving their, uh, their egos and their power and their status rather than being receptive to God's message. Someone want to read uh, 278 through uh, 82? Uh, oh, yeah, Monica, you want to read? Deja, do you want to read? Mustafa, you want to read? Anaton, do you want to read? Awesome. I think Chilla. Boston will see. Go ahead. Oh, where'd it go? There's been many chats. So VC chat one, uh, and then uh, Abby just posted it. Uh, you scroll up a little, two seventy eight through uh, eighty two. This one is shit that I just not know. Thank you, found it. Among them are Gentiles who do not know the Scripture except through hearsay, then assume that they know it. Therefore, woe to those who distort the Scripture with their own hands, then say this is what God has revealed, seeking a cheap material gain. Woe to them for such distortion, and woe to them for their illicit gains. Eternity of Heaven and Health Some have said, Hell will not touch us except for a limited number of days. Say, have you taken such a pledge from God? God never breaks his pledge. Or are you saying about God what you do not know? Indeed, those who earn sins and become surrounded by their evil work will be the dwellers of hell. They abide in it forever. As for those who believe and lead a righteous life, they will be the dwellers of paradise. They abide in it forever. Inshallah. This is uh, really interesting. In uh, 278, right, uh, the, the word for Gentiles that uh, translated there is ummi. If you consult the traditional Muslims, they'll tell you that ummi means uh, illiterate. Uh, they've twisted this word to basically try to make it seem like the prophet couldn't read or write. But what's fascinating is if you read this verse and you say, okay, among them are illiterates who do not know the scripture except through hearsay, then assume they know it. It seems like, okay, it could potentially fit. Read the next sentence, the next verse. It says, therefore, woe to those who distort their scripture with their own hands. If you put the, the, uh, the, this word as illiterate, 
And that next verse wouldn't make sense because it's specifically talking about those who are distorting the scripture, those of what they write with their own hands. So this topic has come up a lot lately where the uh, tradition comes from and they talk about how um, is illiterate and this and that. And if you think about it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense um in terms of uh let's say okay, let's say the first day Muhammad was illiterate. Do you think he would be interested in learning how to read and write to be able to learn to read God's scripture. You think after twenty three years, he would be interested in that? It just doesn't make sense. The whole story. It, I mean, just and you look if you think about it, just very obvious terms. It's a very un un unreasonable um, depiction of the prophet. Um. So. Yeah. So that's. It's just not acceptable. We have so many facts about this in terms of uh, the prophet being literate, not illiterate. Um, no, I didn't say he doesn't need. I didn't say he needs to read. I said being a messenger of God, a prophet of God, getting the scripture, you would think that he would be interested in learning how to read God's scripture um, as it's being written down. What else is uh, interesting is if you go and consult the uh, traditionalists today, they'll tell you that, like, look, you know, some people, they might go to hell temporarily, and there's, you know, hadith that say anyone who says la 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 is guaranteed paradise, that if th these sounds simply come out of an individual's mouth, they're guaranteed they will go to heaven. They say that even if they go to hell, it'll be temporary, but then they'll be uh, redeemed after they, you know, burn off their sins. It's fascinating, as you read this verse in 280, it says, Some have said hell will not touch us except for a limited number of days. Have you taken such a pledge from God? God never breaks his pledge. Or are you saying about God what you do not know? Here you have like hadith that directly contradict the Quran. And rather than conceding and saying, okay, look, these are uh, fabricated hadith. Uh, there's no way that this is uh, uh, possible. What they do is they still distort the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the words of God. And they follow through with their uh, misunderstandings. The new iconoclasm wrote, the eternity of hell doesn't sound very merciful. Uh, concept that you have to realize, it's God allows anyone who wants to freely choose to go to paradise or go to hell. Aspect is, individuals, when given this choice, is the vast majority of them choose to go to hell. And this is like hard to comprehend, but look at the example of Satan. Satan goes and he basically defies God. God gives him a commandment. You know, and he says, no, I'm not going to do it. Rather than repenting and reforming, he doubles down and says, grant me a respite till the day of resurrection. I'm going to prove you wrong. The concept is every day you have this choice. You can either draw closer to God or further away. And when you're doing that, what you're doing is you're sealing your fate. And God, out of his mercy, allows people to decide to not be in his kingdom. The absence of God is hell. God is not going to force someone to basically be his uh, worshiper. God's not going to force someone to be in his uh, uh, domain. Uh, domain. Uh, if they want to leave, they're more than welcome to. This is a choice that every single person uh, uh, makes. If you think that this is, uh, you know, why it seems unbelievable that someone would make such a choice, consider this. The likeliness of making it to heaven, if you're rich and wealthy, is way harder than if you're poor. That's a fact. Because the more you have, the more you're responsible for. 
If I was to offer you $10 million, would you take it? I bet 99.9999999% of the population would take it in a heartbeat. Despite the fact that they just made the probability of them being able to make it to heaven that much more difficult. You know, this is where the crux is. That we say, you know, in essence, we want to go to heaven. At the same time, we do things every day in our life that make that possibility that much harder. So if we really want it, you know, uh, our actions should correspond with it. The reality is what we say and what we do don't always align. So a question was asked about uh, the number of days in hell. Um, the question is, isn't there a covenant that says the number of days in hell is limited? Uh, I don't know. Is there is there a verse? And this is a, this is a, a rhetorical no, question. No. It says, uh, "Have you made such a covenant with God? Like, did you get a promise from God that it's only going to be a number of the days?" It doesn't mean that such a covenant exists. Yeah, there is no such covenant. You know, think of this. Uh, there's verses in the Quran that uh, God tells us to say, look, if there's a book with better guidance, then I'll be the first to follow it. But these are rhetorical questions. There's another one that says, even if God had a son, I'd be the, uh, God's utmost uh, worshiper. You know, this is one of the mechanisms that God uses to kind of show the uh, illogical uh, uh, concepts that are kind of brought up. Even if you side with them, you know, uh, the aspect, you say, okay, this is real, then show me the covenant if there's only a set number of days and they can't all they have are basically fabricated hadith to to make such a uh, claim from i think there's verses of the opposite where it talks about like they abide in it for eternal eternity and like no one none shall escape it and it's everything about it is forever mm -hmm. One of the mistakes I think you know, we make is that we think that, look, I'm just going to commit a little bit of sin and then I'll repent and reform and, you know, clean up my act. Each time we do that, likeliness of us coming back to the, uh, the, the, the right path, the truth, uh, the way of God diminishes. We think somehow we're above this. Uh, I knew people, they said, look, I'm young, I'm going to party, I'm going to have, you know, a, a good time. When I get older, then I'll become uh, reverent and believe. What they realize is they just kind of sealed their uh, likeliness of never coming back. Because when they saw the truth and they face it and they said, they acknowledge that, yes, this is the way to perfect health, wealth, happiness in this world and in the hereafter. They said, you know what, that sounds nice, but I really want to sin right now. It shows that they didn't really believe. And when you read uh, 281, it says, indeed, those who earn sins and become surrounded by the evil works will be the dwellers of hell. They abide in it forever. And when we surround ourselves with, uh, with sin, and just a uh, you know uh, vice, the probability of us being able to to decipher, let alone recognize the truth, diminishes. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's interesting is uh, Surah Seven of the Quran, Al Arf. Uh, it's the uh, purgatory, and uh, the word Arf means someone who recognizes. The aspect is once we fail to recognize uh, the distinction between good and evil, the probability of us being able to uh, uh, act accordingly in a, uh, a righteous manner diminishes you know when someone's moral compass is just decayed to the point where they can no longer distinguish right from wrong there's really almost no hope of them finding their uh, uh guidance back to god's uh, uh path um, okay you can talk it's okay it's okay sister. you can say something oh i was just gonna say in support of what you were saying uh, Surah 3, verse 135, I posted in the chat. If they fall in sin or wrong their souls, they remember God and ask forgiveness for their sins. And who forgives the sins except God? And do, and they do not persist in sing, sins knowingly. So we know from God we shouldn't know his commandments and then continue to disobey them or 
fall into sin, so God willing, if we have read something. And the great thing about it is also if you are not aware of something and you've done a sin, God forgives you because you were not aware of that. And you probably didn't get to that part of the Quran or no one told you. But if you do know it, it's best and you sh that you shall. No. But um, we should not, you know, continue to do those sins after knowing it is, you know, forbidden. That way. So, Basim, were you going to make a comment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing is, like, I was just thinking about what you what you were saying that, you know, young people, you know, they have still, like, uh, they're still young. And, you know, they're going to do stupid decisions no matter what. So uh, I think it's very, like, uh, it's very unpredictable to understand, like, as a young man or a young uh, girl or whatever you, how old you are, you still have the time to 40 to, to make that decision. Or how do you see it? Aspect is we have till the age of 40 to uh, uh, make the decision afterwards, you know, not only are we going to be responsible for everything after 40, but also before. Because when we repent, it basically wipes the slate clean. It transforms our sins into credit. Uh, but the, the fact is, longer someone puts off, uh, you know, they have the truth and they neglect it, they disregard it, the uh, probability of them coming back just diminishes. You know, it's because you're going to get more and more fixed in your ways. Literally, like our physiology, our neuroplasticity of our minds uh, diminishes. Uh, you know, the expression, the trope, it's a, it's hard. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. There's some truth to that. You know, when our, we're young, our minds are malleable. Uh, we can basically assess information and make uh, discretions, change our opinions and stuff. The older we get, the more fixed we get into our ways, the less likely it is that we're going to come around. So someone who says, like, they think that they found a loophole in God's system where they can go and commit all the sin they want. And then, look, before 40, they'll just repent and then they'll get back on track. What they forget is that this is not something that we get out of logic and reason. From the verse we read, this is a blessing from God that he opens up our hearts. If we're being uh, um, unreceptive to God's message and, you know, God being able to uh, open up our hearts, then the likeliness of us thinking we're going to do it on our own is zero. This is something that God gives to those who are sincere. If someone is insincere and they leave, uh, live a life of uh, basically heathenism, um, and again, the, the likeliness of them being able to see the truth, let alone act on it, just diminishes. So you, you're literally talking about addictions. So we, we all have addiction in, in our past. That's how I see it also. But, you know, but addiction has a way to... To comprehend and even understand so yeah i understand your part but at the same time it could take time for someone to you know to understand the, the addiction you have in your life it could be anything just uh, as as anybody has because at the end of the day we all have some type of cleansing we need to do and the thing is that the hard part is to understand what it is that we need to cleanse in our life because there is always something we are trapped in always something a sin or whatever we are doing, we're doing something wrong and we need to be sincere in that aspect also to understand what it is. Maybe I'm a guy that always questioning everything. Maybe there's a guy who smokes weed every day. You know, there could be anything. So we need to understand like where the standpoints come from and how it is. And uh, as you're saying, like you, you, you closer you come to the age, or like the higher you get in the age, you get closer to that, to that point. But, you know, there can be a person who just, got a message when he was 38 years old and he's addicted to drugs for example it could take a year for that person it could take two years we don't know but at the same time it is a process everybody has a process in the end and uh, hopefully like even if you are uh, submitting you see that you have to understand that no matter what because we never know how a person can uh, come to the conclusion uh, in in the aspect of uh, being a submitter totally submitting to god alone so uh, I think the only thing that we can do is just to warn someone, and at the end of the day, only God knows the best.
There's a in the chat. There's a discussion regarding uh, intercession, and uh, in the Quran, um, you see there's like two uh, two expressions that are used. One is it says uh, uh, there's absolutely no inter uh, you know to God belongs all intercession, uh, that no one else can intercede. And there's other verses that say uh, intercession is permissible uh, only by those that act in accordance with God's will. Uh, there's an appendix on this subject, but basically the uh, concept is this. Say I wish that my mother, uh, you know, um, makes it to a paradise. I implore God to accept my mother in paradise. If my mother was already destined to go to paradise, then that's in accordance with God's will. If, you know, God forbid my mother wasn't in accordance with uh, going to paradise. It doesn't matter how many times I pray for her forgiveness, her admittance. It's, it's not going to do any good. Surah 9, verse 70, I believe. 970, it says, uh, even if you prayed uh, for them 70 times, God would not uh, forgive them. And, that, and this is in reference to the uh, prophet of God. If he, no one else can, and we have examples in the Quran. Abraham couldn't pray for, uh, intercede on behalf of his father. Noah couldn't intercede on behalf of his uh, son. Lot couldn't intercede on behalf of uh, uh, his wife. You know, if these individuals who were as close to the uh, prophets and messengers couldn't intercede on the behalf of their loved ones, you know, what makes them think that they can intercede on our behalf or we can intercede on the behalf of anyone else? Um, I think intercession only, you can, they can only be upon the, for the believers. You cannot intercede for these believers. And uh, the whole uh, intercession belongs to God and he gives it to whom he wills. But again, it's in accordance with God's will, right? God has already redeemed the believer. Of believers. course, everything in the heaven and the earth happens with the will of God. Nothing can happen against the will of God, right? Do you think that my praying is going to change the outcome for some other individual uh, after they've passed? Could prophet pray for the believers? There's a difference. You know, you, we can pray for anything, but the aspect is once their fate is sealed, is there anything that anyone can do to change that? Against the will of God, of course, there's not. But God himself says in the Quran that intercession will be uh, allowed to someone. Only for those who act in accordance with God's will. It's the same thing. So if God says the believers are going to uh, paradise. The one who took covenant with God. If I say, God, please allow the believers in paradise, my prayer is in accordance with God's will. What? So God says the believers are to be admitted to paradise. I pray to God to allow the believers to be admitted to paradise. For my prayer is in accordance with God's will. So the aspect is, that this is the whole point, that there is no point in intercession, is that God is the one who's going to dictate. All we can do is, if our prayers are match with what God has uh, decreed, then in essence, it, uh, uh, it's effective. If it's not, then it's ineffective. Of course, the whole concept is the same thing applies to everything else, not just the prayers. This is specific. The, the aspect if I is kill, if die. I want to kill a person, if I want to kill a person, and I decide to do it, and if it's not according to the will of God, it will not happen. I will not be able to do it. Right? There is a fundamental difference here, is because when we're dealing with intercession, this is after someone has already passed, meaning that their time on this world is already done. It's already been accounted for. And when you're you're dealing with aspects of life and death. Uh, this is something that, again, God decrees when someone's going to be born, the moment they're going to be die. Once they die, whatever good deeds, bad deeds, everything they've done, there's nothing we can do to alter that at that point. This is different than if someone's alive and they come to you and they say, hey, pray for my forgiveness. That's something that we actually do. But, but to think after the fact, someone has passed and then, you know, our prayers are going to change the outcome of anything. It's like, you know, the, the events have already occurred. Can't go and change the, uh, the 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 past anymore.
Hello? Okay. Yeah, I wasn't uh, sure. So, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, there's only one minute for Kron talk to end. So maybe we should be quick and then read like one no, no. more line. <laughs> no, 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 no. Kron talk is fine. Um, it's just we're opening it up from the specific verses to other verses. Yeah, yeah. This is what I meant. Yeah. Um, yeah, is there any any specific uh, questions? I guess one thing I was just going to say real quick. So the question was about uh, Mount Sinai, and it's in the Quran. Um, but yeah, is there any other question that anyone has that they want to raise here? Any verses that you're curious about or want to learn about a Quranic subject? Or any comments also that we can learn from? Is there any verses in the Quran that I never understood? You want me to you want me to bring controversial verses that can potentially cause poisonous doubts in people's minds? <laughs> no, I don't want to talk about that. the the aspect of understanding something, it's it's actually uh, uh, there's a, a fallacy here because Sometimes we don't realize what we're blind to, right? Uh, we're, we're, we're blind to our own uh, blindness. We can read a verse, you know, uh, a million times, then always fail to see something that's like, you know, so glaringly obvious. Um, so the aspect is that we're constantly uh, praying to God to increase our knowledge, uh, to uh, give us more insight into the uh, verses. Um, yeah, needless to say, I mean, there's stuff that uh, we read that we say, okay, there's probably something more here, but I, I don't know exactly. I think we we talked about some of this in the uh, in the uh, Quran study itself. Um, but uh, yeah, there's you know infinite amount of uh, wisdom embedded in the Quran. Um, so there's plenty, plenty <laughs> we don't understand. All right, Monica used a couple of verses. Let's read it. 2181 says, If anyone alters a will he had heard, the sin of altering befalls those responsible for such altering. God is here. Noah, 2450, is there a disease in their hearts? Are they doubtful? Are they afraid that God and his messenger may treat them unfairly? In fact, it is they who are unjust. So, Monica, do you want to state your uh, your question about these verses? Yes, yes. Uh, I think that some people uh, say that, you know, Russia can be wrong, Russia can be, you know, uh, say something wrong. But in that verse, God says that, are they afraid that God and his messenger might treat them unfairly? Like, R Russia can say a lie to us. He can be unfair to us. Everyone has to be understand that because God say, say in this verse so clearly that God and the messenger can treat them unfairly. In fact, it is the it is they who are unjust. In my opinion, yeah.
Interesting. Yeah, I just looked at a bunch of the, I just loaded a bunch of the verses just before and after just to see the full context. Um, yeah, no, I totally agree as the um, concept of a messenger to judge in our affairs. We just say we hear and we obey. Then it says obedience is an obligation. Um, yeah, so that's, that's really interesting. I haven't really focused on those verses before. I didn't really, I mean, I knew about them, obviously, but I never really read them. Uh, in this way to kind of get this full message that you're describing. So that's pretty cool. Um, okay. Anyone else have any Quranic questions they want to ask? Let's see. Like close by says in the Quran, it says God's system is unchangeable and cannot be modified. But we know that some aspects of the system were modified. Like Ramadan, sexual of course, was made permissible uh, in the night. To an amateur reader, how do we explain this surface contradiction? Yeah, I don't think uh, there is a contradiction because uh, basically um, it's just a rule that is modified. There's nothing wrong with that. So I don't see anywhere that it says that God's rules cannot be adjusted according to God's you know, will. If I was to add to that, it's uh, you know, the the commandments are different than the uh, the system. And if I'm not mistaken, it actually uses the term uh, uh, sunnah uh, in the verses that Rashad translates as a system that uh, God's system doesn't change. Um, that if God gives a commandment, we're obligated to follow that commandment. God can give different commandments and have different obligations or different dietary prohibitions, um, but it's all the same system. Uh, God creates these uh, uh, systems, then it's our duty to abide by them. Um, I think if you narrow down and you say, okay, God's system is that, you know, the dietary prohibitions are uh, these four, then that would negate the fact that the children of Israel had different dietary prohibitions than what we do. Um, you know, to each congregation, each community, uh, God gave different uh, rights, and they're each responsible for upholding it. So my my take is that, again, God's system... Uh, isn't the, the, the rights themselves, is the fact that God is the one who institutes those rights. It's the people's responsibility to uphold them. And also the other aspect is that if we, you know, go astray, uh, we get punished for it. Yeah, you see a lot of these that are talks about like, oh, there are uh, contradictions in the Quran. One of the ones that comes up a lot um, is it says, we create all living things from uh, water. Uh, it says we create the human being from dust. Uh, it says that we shaped Adam from clay, like wet clay. Uh, and they say, look, this is a, a contradiction. And what's funny is it just depends on the frame of reference you're looking at. If I say, for instance, uh, how do I make an uh, apple pie? You say, okay, well, you know, you need apples, you need flour, you need uh, eggs, you need butter, whatever. I say, okay, well, what are those ingredients made from? You know, what is an apple made from? It's like, oh, well, it's made from, you know, uh, uh, seed that you plant into the ground. And then from that, you add water and sunlight and, you know, nutrients and minerals and you get apples. Like, okay, now you're saying that, you know, it came from uh, uh, dirt. Uh, and you say, okay, well, where did the dirt come from? Well, you know, there was this uh, uh, explosion created these heavenly bodies uh, these stars reached certain mass and then when they exploded it created dust that formed planetary bodies that eventually formed dirt okay so it came from you know dust it's the same thing it's like these references we look at it's funny that people think that in essence like oh this is a contradiction it just depends again on how you're viewing things you can always kind of try to create something that uh, gives the appearance of a contradiction the reality is, it's like again, uh, it just has to do with the, uh, the 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 frame of reference.
Can we settle this dispute once and for all? I was just getting kind of uh, protracted. This whole idea that uh, Misr is not Egypt, and the common translation is just Misr means Egypt. Can we just settle this so this argument is done with? It's, uh, to me, it's like it's one of those things that wants to say it's not Egypt. <laughs> It's like, okay, go ahead. It's, uh, I don't know. I, I feel like it's one of these uh, rabbit holes. Um, but it's just kind of like uh, not really worth going down. I agree with you. And I feel like, I don't know, we have like, you know, like a submitter here spending like uh, an hour debating this or almost two hours debating this. It's like... <laughs> I don't know, it's like, we could be growing our souls. I mean, this is just, it's a perfect example of the, the human tendency. You know, we should be worried about uh, uh, our worship practices, uh, you know, refraining from idol worship, and, uh, you know, these things that really impact. Are we doing enough to be appreciative, to give to charity? But rather, it's like, you know, there's this tendency to, to kind of nitpick on things that are really inconsequential in the grand scheme of things. If, uh, let's say, hypothetically, you know, oh, it's not Egypt, it's somewhere else. Does that uh, impact our soul? Does it change the way that we uh, lead a righteous life? Um, and I feel like, you know, there's endless of these threads that someone can pull on to to try to extract and extrapolate you know, information. But this is the, the funny thing about Surah 3, verse 7. It says, you know, the, the majority of the Quran is straightforward. And then there is certain words, right, that are multi-meaning. Uh, and then those who want to cause uh, division, fighting, uh, uh, disputes, they're going to pursue those multiple meaning verses. And the real giveaway, it's not to share their ideas, uh, it's strictly to sow dissent. I think the second we do that, that we want to propagate an understanding, not just because, hey, we're, we find this interesting, but it's literally to just like say, who's on this side, who's on that side, we're falling into the devil's trap. It's like, is it so hard to just say, look, I don't think it's this, so, you know, uh, take it or leave it and leave it at that. But you show it, it shows its ego. And we really aren't content unless someone, you know, basically concedes and with an absolute certainty that uh, we have to follow this understanding. But God warns us about this. This is what the children of Israel did. This is what every religion does. It's just like, you know, share the idea. Hey, it's not Egypt. OK, cool. And then, you know, let's focus on the uh, the, the, the more important aspects. So, I mean, if we did have a debate about, like, how many units of prayer we're doing, I feel like that would be more beneficial because it has practical application of our lives in terms of identifying Pharaoh and these other things. But they're why? Interesting. Yeah, they're interesting. I think one of the coolest verses, <laughs> coolest verses, but it's like it's such a uh, for this topic is in uh, Surah 18, where it talks about the sleepers of the, 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 the cave. It's very fascinating that God, Lord of the universe, intentionally, you know, these things that human beings get so infatuated with, God just didn't leave it out. God didn't tell us their names. God didn't tell us the name of the dog, you know, what exact cave this was, any of this information. In the, the, in the verse, it says, some say that there was three, the fourth was the dog, others said five and six was the dog, others said seven and eighth was their dog. It says, none knows the true meaning except uh, that of God. It says, uh, don't argue with them. Just go along with them. It doesn't matter. You know, it's like this is the, the, the repeat of the uh, uh, sacrifice of heifer. You know, which one? Which color? How do we know? Well, this one's better. This one, you know, has this quality. It's like, dude, God just told us, like, just do this. And there's this tendency, like, you know, the last Quran study, we're bickering about, and I just thought it's so funny. It's a bunch of dudes bickering about the dress code of women that literally has nothing to do with our own salvation. Not a single one of us in that discussion are women, let alone concerned with what we're going to wear. But we were so interested to understand what, you know, the, the, the proper dress code of women was. That, you know, we're willing to kind of like go back and forth. But it's like, dude, I put the verse there. You know, if you're a woman, read it and try to apply it to the best of your ability. It was just a bunch of guys arguing about it. Hey, so we have a couple questions. Monica had a question about uh, this verse, uh, 1591. I can try to answer real quick. So it says the they accept the Quran only partially. Um, <clears throat> so I think this is in regards to, it can be in regards to certain 
you know, aspects of the Quran, certain verses that contain certain commandments, and you just ignore them, and you you disregard, you know, whatever you don't like or what doesn't fall in line with your interests or what you perceive as your interests. And that's basically accepting the Quran partially. You accept some parts of it and you reject some parts of it. And this can be manifested in many different ways in my view. It's like, you know, when we, we read the Quran, um, we have to, to realize, like, this is not us critiquing the book. This is God's critique of mankind. And uh, if we read something that doesn't sit well with us, it doesn't mean that, in essence, like, okay, hey, just uh, blindly accept it. Just be patient. You know, I, I just contemplate that, that it's like, look, you know, the, 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 the prophet of God, how many years did he have to uh, be patient before he uh, received the entire Quran? You know, and us, by God's leave, we can read the, the entire thing if we wanted to, you know, in a sitting. But uh, the aspect is the information is still going to take time for it to be unlocked in our minds. Um, we just have to be, you know, patient with that process. Uh, when we read something and immediately we, we say, hey, I don't like this. It's as if we're, we're the ones judging the Quran. And it's not like that. You know, so many times there's verses that I believe, you know, God does intentionally to bring out our true convictions, uh, read under the, you know, the wrong light, seem uh, like it doesn't, you know, it's uh, contradictory to the rest of uh, God's statement. For patient, you know, God's going to show us the, the reason behind that verse or what its uh, meaning is. One of the ones we read last week is talking about Pharaoh that, you know, he inflicted the worst punishment, slaughtering their sons and sparing their daughters. You know, how many feminists read that and say, oh, my God, this is so uh, sexist. This is God's favoring of the men over the, uh, the, 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 the women. And they don't stop to think hey, what happens to a society where its warriors, its soldiers are all annihilated, leaving only their women. What happens to the women in that society? Like, this is the reason that it's such a, uh, a terrible punishment. Um, but again, you know, someone can read that and immediately say, okay, I reject this book. I don't like it. You know, this verse doesn't sit well with me. If you acknowledge that, look, this is the word of God. And, you know, to think that you're going to understand God's word the first time around, or even, you know, after years of study, uh, is just hubris on our part. Fareed, did you want to say something? Go ahead, man. Can you hear me? I guess not. I don't know. I thought I heard him. All right, Monica, does that answer your question? I put a verse actually here, 5101. Yes, thank you a lot. Okay, so I put a verse, 5101. It says, oh, you believe, do not ask about matters which if, if revealed to you prematurely would hurt you. If you ask them, if you ask about them in light of the Quran, they will become obvious to you. God has deliberately overlooked them. God is forgiver clement. So what this says is, look, there's certain aspects of the Quran, there's matters in there that you're not going to understand right away. You need to be patient. The problem is the human being is not patient. What I've seen over and over again is basically this concept that's like a person spends 30 seconds on a verse and then they have the same level of conviction that God is one on that understanding that they extracted from the verse and they'll either say the verse is wrong the quran is wrong or the other person saying a different point of view is wrong and then a week later or six months later they have a different point of view it's like we should be very hesitant about something especially when we haven't done that much research on it um we should be very careful even if we have done research i feel like we have to be careful and just tread lightly and think about the different possibilities we were uh, talking about this the other day. Um, we were saying, like, you know, we shouldn't have the same level of conviction and faith in all the things we believe, right? Uh, if I believe the, the oneness of God with absolute certainty, it doesn't mean that, you know, I believe uh, that, uh, you know, Jesus was 33 years old when he died. Like, if I have that same level of conviction towards that as I do the oneness of God, I'm, you know, misallocating my, oh, my priority. Yeah. Oh, you want to say something? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Peter. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, I heard you say something about the Pharaoh, you know, before Navid spoke last time. 
So you're talking about the pharaoh killed, um, you know, he slaughtered the daughters and the sons of people. And you need to say something about that? Yeah, so the, the verse says he inflicted the worst persecution, slaughtering your sons while sparing your daughters. Right, right. No, I was just going to say, which pharaoh are you talking about? Just going back to that, you know, um, <laughs> Egypt. And if Egypt, it's Egypt or, you know, whatever. So I, have a, I had a question about that for you, Farid. So let's say I say it's Tutankhamun. How is that going to benefit your soul? No, no, but that's not it. The thing is, I, it benefits you because you need to identify things in the Quran so we would know what are we talking about. But don't you think if it, if it mattered, God would tell me his name? Like, it's, uh, if I say no, Catherine but, but E, let's hold say, on let's Let me say, say this, this. Let's say this part didn't matter. But let's say other things in the Quran that have labels and names, don't you think that we should know what they are? So we would know what we're talking so, about? Let me give you an example. In the Quran, we have uh, Adam and Eve, but Eve is not mentioned in the Quran by name. It doesn't so, matter. I don't need to know that. That's fine. That's okay. But let's say I say it's Hawa, Adam and Hawa, right? So what, why doesn't it matter? I can just, we can just argue about what her name was, right? So the whole point is like, why does it matter what Pharaoh's name was? What you need to know is... I don't need to know the Pharaoh's name. I need to know that the Pharaoh is the Pharaoh of Egypt. Or is he... What, what is the Pharaoh? What is the meaning of the Pharaoh? Is, is the Pharaoh the Pharaoh that we talk about? Is, does it mean someone who's um, like a dictator? Does, does it mean that he's someone who's good? I need to know the definition of the name. That's what I need to know. But I don't need to know if he was Akhenaten or Tut Anchamun or um, Ramesses or Seti. I don't need to know which pharaoh it is. I just need to know that a pharaoh is what a pharaoh is by definition. Can you hear me? Can't hear you. Does anyone want to answer that? I kind of have an answer, but does anyone want to comment on that point? Oh, good. Good. Oh, you want me to answer? Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, I was just gonna say. Look, uh, I think we, we, I think we understand from the verses in the Quran what it's referring to when it talks about the Pharaoh. It's talking about the ruler of Egypt with this particular title, and it's a particular individual that is having interactions with children of Israel, particularly Moses and Aaron and others, and it's talking about a specific individual who has interactions with his advisors, one of which is identified, I guess, as Haman, and he's the ruler there, and he's calling the shots, and he's doing these things. So, I mean, let's just say someone had no idea of history or even heard about Egypt or any of these things. I think just from reading the Quran, they get a pretty good idea as to what it's talking about here. I feel like the lessons are just timeless and they're pretty self-explanatory in regard to what we're exactly dealing with. So to answer your question, I mean, it's just we know who, we know what it's talking about in terms of what this pharaoh is, what's going on. There's so many lessons in the story. And then at the end of it, basically he's drowning and he says he submits to the Lord of the Moses and Aaron and God says it's too late. The angels say it's too late. And he hasn't grown his soul or done anything to develop his real self. So, um, yeah, I mean, it represents so much in terms of what we can identify it as. If you want to look at it in terms of allegorical terms, there's a lot of lessons to be learned there. So it's just packed with so many important um, um, issues to, uh, I guess, that we reckon with throughout our lives. The individual is mentioned uh, 74 times in the uh, Quran, um, and it's uh, his character, what he did, his atrocities, why he was wicked. You know, it's all encompassed in the uh, those uh, verses. Um, we can go and look at history and study and stuff like that, but I feel like it, it, what we need as far as for the uh, the, the, the lessons learned they're embedded inside these verses itself. Meaning, if you had no clue where Egypt was, what Egypt was, you know, what Pharaoh is, what the, the Egyptian dynasty is, pyramids, any of this stuff, 
the, the verses of the Quran contain all you need in order to take away those lessons that God wants us to learn. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions or comments about these Quranic topics or anything else in the Quran? This is now open to um, basically all the verses and all the issues that you can think of in the verses. Asim, I'm calling out. Do you have any questions, bro? I know you usually have a lot of questions. Are you tapped out today? No, I'm good, bro. I'm good. But, uh, yeah, you know, I'm going to always ask anything. And the thing is, like, when you guys are saying, you're saying now, like, literally, like, we don't need uh, to go outside the Quran. Is that what you're saying? Or what do you mean about that? Because it was very unclear what you said. Like, for an example, about the Pharaoh thing. If it's Ramses, uh, why can't we say that it's Ramses if God, if we can, like, point it out in history? What I'm saying, it's it's not necessary for the lessons that God wants us to learn uh, based no, on no, this no, history. Yeah. yeah, I mean, by all means, yeah, definitely. I think it's it's cool when people they go and they study these uh, the the archaeology, the history, and stuff. But, you mm. know, this is uh, secondary as far as it, it's just interesting that God, the Quran, He doesn't uh, specify these things that as human beings, like if we're writing a biography, you know, of Pharaoh. Uh, the stuff that we mm. focus on is totally relevant to the stuff that God is going to describe. You know, we'd be describing his eye color yeah. and uh, his features and his yeah, family, yeah, yeah. you know, and of these course. things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what year was but, it? That, no, I was just thinking, I was reflecting what, what you guys were saying, because at the same time, we are also like, we want to know the details when we go to the, when we go, for example, to the Bible. Isn't that true? So it's like, uh, okay, it's God's words, and you know the thing is like when you go to the when you go to the Bible, it's the same thing. You're trying to get the details also. Then you're not like literally uh, like how they convince what God is saying in the Quran also at the same time. You see, you see what I'm getting here because for me it feels like that also because we need sometimes to know some type of details because people are questioning a lot of things and the answer is out there no matter what. The answer is going to be there and you're going to find it in the Quran also. I'm not saying you're not going to find it in the Quran, but you're going to, you can use other sources also to combine it. Like what, what God is saying, the Quran supersedes everything. So yeah. this is how I see it. You know, can I, mean? I just, can I just elaborate on that point? So you asked me that yeah. question. Um, I agree. And I explained what I thought about this in terms of what we need for our salvation in the Quran. It's all there. Um, but yeah. let's just say we want to do additional analyses, and then I go to Egypt. Like you went to Egypt and you visited these tombs, right? And then you learned mm. about the Pharaoh whose body has been examined, and then they found they found like, for example, salt. Salt. Yeah, salt yeah, in the body. Right. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so that's additional information that I can benefit from. It's interesting. It further confirms, you know, God's miracles and His message. But I don't necessarily need to travel to Egypt and witness that and identify the Pharaoh to understand all the lessons and the meanings <laughs> of the verse. Of course not. Of course not. Who said that? Right? I'm just so, saying, no, no. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course, of course not. So another question was just asked if any, and uh, it's open to discussion. The question was, uh, by Zylura, why is a universal practice necessarily true? Um, I can give a brief answer and anyone else wants to answer, they can do that. So I think a universal practice is necessarily true because unity among a community and congregation serves a very valuable aspect and it has a lot of benefits in terms of furthering the cause of God as, and uh, spreading God's message. Unity among believers 
is a very valuable tool that um, is immensely uh, 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 powerful. That's just a brief explanation. Do I have anyone else want to describe in terms of this question? No, I don't think it's true because communities say so. I think it's true because God says so. We have many examples about this, right? So in terms of like the groups of believers um, in the Quran where there's time of war and they're able to congregate, they take turns like bowing and prostrating, but whatever they're doing, even if we want to argue, you know, we don't need to get into the argument of what they were doing. Whatever they're doing involves some kind of activity that basically um, involved the congregation and so there's a group of them it says look you stand and you have your weapons and protect them but beyond that um there is unifying practices and if you're not so f we can see this with quranism right so for example with Qur quranism or quranist there is no unity among them there is no congregation of quranists there can never be a congregation of quranists so if i want to believe quranism is the truth there's nothing i can do to Unify my efforts with anyone. Um, even if you go to the like Quranist, like the most they'll have is like an online like community of Quranist Quranism, and it's just even if you go there, the whole time they're just arguing. They have no unity on any topic. The only thing they they agree on is that Hadith is um, wrong. Even on the concept of the mess, uh, the what is it called? The um, what is it called? The Prophet Muhammad, they don't even agree that we shouldn't worship him. I think the latest poll on the Quranist, uh, the Quranist um, subreddit or whatever, whatever public platform it was, was that 50 over 50% of the Quranists said that you have to mention Muhammad in your Salat or Shahada. Wait, I think you're, it's wrong to say that that is a worship of Muhammad. You are wrong there. And we can argue if you want. You're saying it's it's mentioning a name other than God next to God is not idol worship. In which mentioning it in which way? I don't know. You tell me. In a way that uh, is accepting him as a messenger. There's a verse in Quran where um, hypocrites come and proclaim that Muhammad is messenger. Right? You know the verse. So, like, uh, why would the why would the hypocrites do it? It's because uh, it's because of what the true believers actually did. Um, they so do you... they bore bore witness. Let me finish. Uh, they bore witness yeah. that uh, Muhammad is messenger of God. So hypocrites trying to imitate the true believers also did that. But God God witnessed. God knows that they lied. They they said something that they didn't believe. They didn't actually believe that he is a messenger. That's why. Oh, no, 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 no. So that's a when you're lying. It's not about belief. You're lying about is about something that you actually is not truthful. No, no, they're not li called liars. They're called hypocrites. No, no. It says God bears witness that the hypocrites yeah, yeah, yeah. are liars. Hypocrite, hypocrite is someone that says something which he himself doesn't believe. They're not. But why liars. are they liars? They're called hypocrites. Why are they liars? No, God says they are hypocrites. No, no, but the verse 63.1, it says, uh, are liars, that the hypocrites in this, after making this yeah. declaration, yeah. why are because, they liars? Yeah, because they don't bear witness that he's a messenger. They they don't really yeah. believe that he's a messenger. This isn't about belief, right? Yeah, if, I, if I don't believe, if I don't believe the sky is blue and I tell you the sky wait, is wait, blue. Let's see the context of the, of the, oh yeah. The context is it's the first verse, bro. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's. It, God is saying that it's acknowledged they're hypocrites, but God is saying that this statement is that they're lying. Uh, uh, the I'll give you an example. Under, so the here. Guise, under the guise of their apparent faith. So the Look at 2844. Is, Look at 2844. believe that he is a messenger. It doesn't matter about belief, right? Does, lying? You, no, no, it doesn't. The, the verse 2 doesn't matter. No, no, no. If I'm yes, sure. making a statement, irrespective of what I believe, I'm a liar if the statement is false. Wait, wait, wait. So is it a lie that Muhammad was messenger of God? No, but it's not that. It's the What's bearing lie? witness. What's lie here? Read 2844. 
God is telling that Muhammad, you were not present on the slope of the Western Mount when we issued the command. You were not a witness. Muhammad said, I bear witness that Muhammad, uh, Moses was a uh, uh, messenger of God. And he wait, would wait, technically wait, wait, wait. be lying as well. Okay, but that, by that logic, I can say that uh, that uh, Prophet Abraham was a liar when he witnessed that there's no God but Allah and that oh. he created heavens and the earth. Was oh. uh, Prophet Abraham present when God created heavens and the earth? Where does he say that? There is a verse, you can find it. When, when when Abraham proclaims his shahada, like when he says, I bear it, like I'm paraphrasing, but you can search for it. When uh, Abraham witnesses that there's no God but Allah, uh, the cre that and that he cre he's the one who created heavens and the earth. So did he actually witness the creation of heavens and the earth? I have to first produce the verse. Oh, uh, if someone can help me search, I'll search in and I'll post if I find it before others. For some reason, it won't let me paste 7172. If anyone knows, uh, I mean, if you're around, I just copy it. It won't let you, it won't, 7172? It won't yeah. let you paste it? For some reason, I'm just going to paste it. It worked for, oh, yeah. No, the bot's down, it looks like. Okay. Yeah, bot's down. So here in 7172, we say, recall that your Lord summoned all the descendants of Adam. This is everyone. This is every single human being and had them bear witness for themselves. Am I not your Lord? They all said, yes, we bear witness. Thus, you cannot say on the day of resurrection, we were not aware of this. God placed in us, not only had us bear witness, he placed in us instinctive knowledge of monotheism. Um, but to say that, in essence, I can bear witness to something that I didn't see for myself. Uh, is not an accurate statement. In order to bear witness, it's uh, chapter twenty-one. He says, "I, <laughs> lords of the, uh, nay, your uh, Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. He who created them, I'm a witness. So, yeah, that the Lord. <laughs> it's not that he's bearing witness to the. Uh, you know, you can twist and try to say that. Oh, this is uh, in, in context to something that it's not." The problem oh, with that is he, he, hmm? he bears witness to God. That's what he's saying. What's the uh, what's the surah number? So this is uh, verse fifty six. What surah number? And again, I, I put seven one seventy two. We can bear witness to uh, God, something that we all, on the Day of Judgment... Can we uh, witness the creation of heavens and the earth? It doesn't say that, though. How come? Because this, this is the testimony to which I bear witness. So he, he, he bears witness that he, is created, he created heavens and the earth? Yeah, I mean, it, it, you're not... Okay, you're taking it in the sense that uh, uh, he witnessed the creation. That's not what the verse says. He's bearing witness that God, Lord of the universe, is the creator of the heavens and the earth. I mean, I'm just perplexed by this. Like, you have all this evidence that basically says, like, look, in order to bear witness to something, you have to see it with your own eyes. You're fixated on trying to find reasons no, to no, say you want to, it's, you it's want to bear English, witness to something you can't. It's about English, English, English uh, translation of the word witness. Like you can't, it's not like an eyewitness or something like that. It's sort of like an acceptance of belief or something like that. You okay, can, I'll show you a verse you, No, I know you're going to post the verse about the, when they, when he didn't witness something. I know which verse you're going to post. it's down sorry but the question still stands like why why the why would the hypocrites do it like the 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 mark of a hypocrite is that like they wanted to like appear 
appear as a genuine believers, right? And they do did hypocrites do what genuine believers do, with the exceptions that they don't do it like honestly. Look, I mean, actually look, believe we what have so 19... they pray, well, let me finish. So they just they pray like uh, genuine believers, right? They pray with them. They do do w w when they're with them. They do everything that that regular believers do. So they do shahada. They they pray. They do this thing. They do that. But when they are alone, they disbelieve, right? So th this is like they, why they why they they do this? Why did they proclaim that Muhammad is the messenger? Precisely because genuine believers did that. But the only difference is that it was apparent faith. They lied. They didn't actually believe that Muhammad was messenger. Okay, but isn't this interesting? You know, again, consistently in the Quran, we say that the Shahada is la 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 la. You really want to basically create uh, sorry, justification. Sorry, can you, can you, you, can let you me finish my shahada point. Slowly. Can you proclaim Shahada slowly? I couldn't uh, understand you, your Shahada. La 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 la. I think you're missing some letters, but okay. okay. Um. You know, that 19 times in the Quran that it says that this is the, the shahad of God, the angels, and knowledgeable. You really are looking for basically to pull straws to justify mentioning Muhammad's name. I mean, if you want to, go ahead. You know, you want to say Muhammad's name in your salat, you're free to do so. No, no, but mentioning anything depends on which context. For example, when we read Quran, we say, we mention Satan, right? We say, It's the context in which we mention Satan that matters, right? Do you... I wouldn't mention Satan in my Salat. I wouldn't mention Satan in my Declaration of Faith. All right, I'm, I'm not saying that you should, but like God. No, tells but you... I mean that's the funny thing is that's the side of the argument you're going on. Like, I mean, just put yourself like from a third party perspective. One party is saying, look, let's just mention God's name. And another party is trying to create justification to mention other entities. It's just bizarre. No, but, but it's also, it's like really important in which context you mention something. Yeah, but you, so again, like, you're trying you to find say, caveats. I'm not saying, uh, well, listen, I'm not saying like you have to mention uh, Muhammad. You have to mention it as a part of Shahada. But I'm also saying like, it's very wrong to, to say that uh, those people who do say Muhammad and Rasulullah, that they are actually like uh, idol worshippers or something like that. I think that's that's also a simple thing to say. So, can I just say something? First of all, I wanted to see where in the Quran did you see that anyone is bearing witness to any messengers? Do you have any verses for that? There's God bearing with. I'll, I'll post you the verses. Okay, yeah, if you could do that. Okay, so I put nine reasons why I believe that there is a God only Shahada. So number one is that Muhammad himself did not say his own name in the Shahada. Number two is we cannot make a distinction among the messengers. If I say Muhammad and don't say Jesus, then I am making a distinction. Number three, Salat is from Abraham, and obviously Abraham did not say Muhammad's name in his Shahada. Number four, in the Quran, the only time we see this Shahada is from the hypocrites. Number five, there is no such Shahada in the Quran. Number six, in Surah Muhammad, the Shahada is in verse 19, only La ilaha illallah. Number seven, the only Shahada in the Quran is God alone, and that's in 318. Number eight, it's grammatically incorrect to say uh, Muhammad is a messenger because Quran teaches us that he was a messenger, so he's not currently a messenger unless you believe he's somewhere on earth preaching the message. Number nine, Shahada means to bear witness, see with your own eyes. And we did not witness Muhammad, we only witnessed God. So that's an incorrect statement, and we cannot make such a statement. I feel like each of these positions alone destroyed the entire proposition in entirety to mention Muhammad in your Shahada. But even if you take them all together, it's overwhelmingly clear that our worship practices should only be devoted to God alone. And the mere mention of a name other than God in any way in a prayer or worship practice or whatever, it's going to be, constitute idol worship and um, nullify our works. The verse I was trying to load, I don't know, for whatever reason, the bot's down currently, is 3945. Um, let me get it here. Did you put it already? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It says, when God alone is mentioned, the hearts of those who not believe in the hereafter 
shrink with aversion. But when others are mentioned beside him, they become satisfied. So that's in the bottom uh, line. In which which context? Because uh, any context. Ask, no, not no, because that's that uh, verse is referring to like when Arabs actually asked like uh, Muhammad to mention their own deities beside God, beside the Allah. So you're saying other deities are okay? It's just not the pagan no, deities? No, no. Which other deity? I don't know. How many deities do you believe exist? <laughs> Seriously, what kind of question is that? But you're, you're trying to say that mentioning the servant of God next to God's name in our declaration of faith is something you want to uphold. Go ahead. Wait, wait, I mean, wait, 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 wait. Hold on a second. Are we supposed to, are, aren't we required to believe in all the messengers of God and all the books of God? Yeah. Yeah, okay. right? so how does so that have to do with belief? So proclaiming, listen, so proclaiming your belief is wrong, actually? The exclusion of all the worship? If you proclaim that, yes, I believe in God and, and all the messengers and all the... The expense books. of basically breaking commandments, yes, it is, right? If I'm only signifying uh, this uh, praise, continuous praise towards one of God's prophets at the expense of all the other ones, then I'm breaking numerous commandments, yes. So, yes, that well, is. No, because... We are supposed to praise the messenger as well. Is the messengers? Praise the messenger, Muhammad. We are? Do you have a verse for that? Yeah, sure. Let me find it. <laughs> Is it going to be 3356? It's just interesting, you know, trying to find justification for, you know, just just allow a tad bit of idol worship, just the tiniest bit. Let me no, just, no. you know, uh, dude, dude, pray idol and send commemoration. Power. You don't even know, like, what's what first define idol worship, and then we can go on talking. Idol worship, it, th this is the whole concept is you think anyone outside of God has any power to harm or benefit you. Exactly. Second, so. that you're setting up a servant of God in your declaration of faith to God alone, you're thinking that this entity somehow miraculously is going to be able to benefit you. No, you completely misunderstand. Like, we are not, we are not. Declaring that to, we're declaring it to God that we accept okay, on the day of judgment, in this book, on, right? The so day of judgment, actually, when you're gonna they make say argument Shahada, to God. no one actually believes that Muhammad has any powers, he's just really so that's man. why they continuously it's perpetually Abdul, commemorate him, they put his name up and the, the, the masjids. That's wrong, I agree, I agree, that's wrong. But you just want a little bit of idol worship, not too much. What? No, no, tell me, where's the idol worship? I told you, nobody believes that he has a superpowers, that he is going to help them himself. Second, you accept any other source other than God in the Quran, when God says, do not make distinctions among God's messengers, and you're trying to make every justification to make a distinction, you're following another you source. On this Discord, you make distinction. You have a whole chapter de dedicated to Rashad Khalifa, and no other me messengers here have their own like uh, sections of Discord. Are you committing idol worship on this? Discord? Wait, 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 hold on, hold on, wait a minute. So in God in the Quran, You're making distinction. hold on a second, hold on a second. So God in the Quran has a chapter called Muhammad, but there's no chapter called Saleh. So you're saying we shouldn't read that chapter called Muhammad? God is allowed to make distinction. An argument. God is allowed to make distinction. So but like, also, are you, we are talking about our actions. Quran, are you committing distinction here by having the Quran was given to Prophet Muhammad? Is that, is that is that a distinction that we're we're basically studying the Quran? It's God. God is the one who gave him the. No, 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 no. God gave the the the, the Quran to Prophet Muhammad, right? So we're studying yeah. the Quran, uh, which is given to Prophet. Is that making a distinction? No. God gave these explanations to uh, Rashad Khalifa. So okay, we're studying these explanations. Chapter for uh, like Muhammad for Abraham. From what are you talking about? If if these if these explanations were given, if the translation was given to Saleh, we would be studying basically uh, what Saleh had to uh, clarify regarding this. Well, why don't we study what uh, Muhammad had to clarify? Didn't. The thing is, you want to study fabrications? You can go ahead. Not on this server. I can say same for for like you're committing idol worship. You are you are distinguishing Rashad Khalifa from all others. Am I am I adding him to my shahada like you? You you have a Discord here just for him. Okay, so but am I am I adding it to my, to my shahada? I trying to say, hey, you know what? Let's send salawat to uh, Rashad Khalifa and his family. No, but you're following his hadith. It's not hadith. What's your definition of hadith? You are you following hadith or not? No. What are the appendixes? If not hadith. hadith. <laughs>
you're, you're taking something that is a fabrication, it's attributed to the Prophet by the name of Hadith. You're saying that something that we actually know, that the uh, Messenger of God, has, his duty was to deliver this message, wait, wait, is wait, now wait. Hadith. Oh, wait a minute. So, I just want to say one knew, thing. If you knew the Hadith was true, Muhammad's Hadith was true, that he said it, you would follow it. So I just put okay. I just put forty verses that proves that Muhammad wasn't allowed to have any religious no, uh, teachings separate from the Quran that is applicable to me. The fundamental difference, if if Muhammad say, for instance, he was saying, "Look, I'm going to write a article explaining this concept from within the Quran, so that it can be further clarified." That's fundamentally different than oh, in some passing comment. Aisha made some nasty aspect about the private life of the Prophet, about how he washed, you know, his clothes. That's you want to uphold that as religious guidance. Go ahead and do so. No, I'm saying we should. Let me just say one thing. Let me say. Hold on, Jamal. Jamal, do you accept that not all of God's messengers uh, had a scripture? Um, do you accept like, this? For example, for example, the traditional Muslims they believe that the uh, messengers are the ones with scriptures. Okay, but I don't care. You can you can have them reverse order. You can believe it if you want to believe it like that. The point is that you believe there are certain people that are designated by God to spread teachings on earth that don't have scripture, correct? Uh, yeah. Okay, so then when they come and bring their teachings, and then I tell you about their teachings, and you can verify that they actually said that, is that hadith? Well, yeah. How are, how are, how are you saying? supposed to... No, no, think about this. No, no, think about this just logically. You're saying there is a, a messenger or a prophet or whatever you want to call them. I don't want to debate that topic right now. That is coming down that doesn't have a scripture and they have teachings. And I say, hey, here's a speech by this messenger. This is his teachings. And you're saying, I don't care about that. It's hadith. How does that make any sense? So what are they supposed to say? So if, based on what you're saying, then that messenger can't say anything. They can't talk. Because anything they say is going to be hadith, right? He can use Quran. Right, but he has to say something about it, right? Well, not really. He can just uh, repeat the word, verses of Quran. Well, I, I can repeat the verses of the Quran. So what makes that person a messenger and me not a messenger? What's the difference? If both of us are only allowed to just say a verse number, then what's the significance of him versus me? Well, but that makes no sense. Yes. To get, let's not to, uh, like stray too far away from the like main subject, which was the shahada, and like, is it uh, allowed to mention? Like, I'm not saying no one is arguing that it's necessary to mention Muhammad, but the the question is, is it allowed? Is it okay? And like, my argument was yes, and then but... the point was like that's uh, that's distinguishing the prophets, and then the, my point was. That like uh, people here are distinguishing Rashad, right? That's not distinction though. That's not that. that and I just gave you the example. I said, forget about Rashad. Let's go back three thousand years or whatever, uh -huh. and we see Saleh, and I have a videotape of Saleh talking about the message, and you're saying I'm not going to watch that. That's Hadith. It's like, well, what is he doing? He's coming to talk to you about his I have message. A question of this, can I ask? Yeah, go ahead. So I was just wondering, with that, like, you guys are always, like, you know, promoting, like, the Quran 19 miracle and everything like that and inviting people to, like, investigate, like, if Rashad's, like, a messenger and things like that, right? Um, and promoting his, like, translation. So of the Quran, like, in a way, wouldn't that also be distinction among the messengers, though? Uh, Jesus no, came and he preached his message, and you say... You know, hey, why are you following uh, the the message that Jesus is preaching? You're you're making a distinction, right? That's not a distinction. Uh, each messenger comes for their time and place. It's our duty to listen to what the messenger has to say. You know, when when Muhammad came, he brought the Quran. You know, if someone says, "Hey, why are you following the Quran?" You're making a distinction of uh, following the Quran, and uh, you're uh, you know making a distinction for following Muhammad. You know, that's not the same thing. Like each one, we basically get what we uh, uh god wills and we just accept it wholeheartedly so you would say distinction is only when like a name is mentioned like specifically though but because you're saying like the shahada right yeah, that's the problem right distinction is, for instance you know when we're, we're elevating one at the expense of the others that becomes a distinction
You know, do you see anything here where we're saying, you know what, you need to add Rashad's name to your Salat. Uh, you can say it during your Shahada. Let's send, you know, have a channel where we send Salawat to uh, Rashad and his family. You know, does any of that exist here? I mean, but like do God traditionals... Do? Oh, sorry, go ahead. They do. They do. Yeah, they, they do. do. They literally... <laughs> this was reported to us today. They literally have a bot on their server. This is the largest server on Discord with 10,000 members. They literally have a bot that anytime you mention Muhammad's name, it automatically sends blessings to him. But how does that put an expense to the other messengers? You, you're saying that's the because problem. Because if I... Yeah, because if I type Yunus or Jonah, it's not going to do that. It's programmed specifically for Muhammad. That's literally the de definition of a distinction. Guys, like distinctions are allowed and God himself uh, dis made distinction between the prophets. The thing is when the distinction between the prophets was forbidden in Quran, it was in context of people making distinction uh, between the messengers in terms of their message. The, the whole point of Quran was that the message of all messengers was in one line. They all followed the same path, right? Wait, Jamal. People were trying to distinguish. If someone can post a verse from Quran, which forbids the, the distinction between the prophets, and then we can look at the con context of that verse to see what kind of distinction we are not allowed to make. Hey, no problem. We're not allowed to make any distinction. God says he made distinctions between messengers. He spoke to some and he didn't speak to some. Like directly, and that's the distinction in that verse, I believe. No, if if God gives us an example, like say for instance, you're in class, the teacher says there's no cheating on the test. Do not look at each other's uh, 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 exams. Does that mean that other forms of cheating all of a sudden become uh, permissible? It's not right. There's multiple ways that a distinction can be made. If you read two two eighty five, you know the response from the believers when God tells them make no distinction among any of His messengers is we hear and we obey. Not, hey, let's try to find caveats where we can justify making distinctions. Yeah, but I also think like it's very dangerous to to pull out a single verse out of context. And it's not a single verse out of context. It. So I think is... we should we should look like at the context of an ayah. What is it talking about? And then we can get a like a full picture. Just funny that it's like, again, if you consider, we have two sides in this debate. One side is saying, look, let's not make distinctions. Let's worship God alone. Let's make our commemoration and uh, worship practices all uh, uh, dedicated to God alone. Then we have another side who's trying to say, hey, well, what if we can just kind of find some scenarios where we can mention Prophet Muhammad? It's like, no, thank you. I prefer not to. Um, it's just funny to me. It's like that, you know, trying to find justifications for stuff like this. I'm not saying I'm in favor of one way or another, but like to Jamal's point, though, wouldn't you say that it is a distinction, though, that like Muhammad had the um, message for the whole world versus like only for a people? Again, that God, no God makes distinctions all he wants. This is God, Lord of the universe. On the day of judgment, all of us are going to be stratified by our rank, right? As far as we're concerned, we treat all of God's messengers as one and the same. God gave the, uh, the Injil to Jesus. We don't argue that. We don't dispute that. You know, God gave the Psalms to David. Again, that's God's decision. We accept that. You know, God gave the, uh, uh, the uh, statute book to, to Moses and Aaron. And God gave the Quran to uh, Muhammad. For us to say, hey, that's a distinction because these books were giving, it's like, okay, then we're missing the point. God can make all the distinctions he wants. When it comes to what we do, we don't make distinctions. I think, like, there's no distinction in the terms of, if we read the ayah, the messenger has believed in, in what was sent down to him from his Lord, so did the believers. They believe in God, his angels, his scripture, and his messengers. We make no dis uh, distinction among any of his messengers. Like, they all believe, they say we hear and obey. So, like, they all believed in Lord, in, mess in angels, in scriptures, in messengers. Like, there was, the point was that uh, people were trying to make distinction in the, like, the, uh, between, like, Moses and Jesus and, and Muhammad. Like, they brought different faiths. But the point of this ayah is to say there is no distinction between them. They are all from same God. They all proclaim the same religion and the same message. And that's why why people shouldn't make distinction between them. 
like there is no like Christian messengers or Jewish or is uh, sub submitters messengers like they're in. Uh, we just we, we just want to mention Muhammad's name and our salawat. That's all. Just want to say Muhammad. You know when we do our shahada, what's the big deal? Just Muhammad. He's just a servant of God. Okay, I'm asking you, what's wrong with saying with the? Uh, you can do it. You can do it, and then God. on the day of judgment. On the day of judgment, you can explain to God why you did that. If you're comfortable with it, go ahead. Wait, no do, one's do, stopping do you. Do you all believe the, that Muhammad is the messenger of God? Of course. So I'm not going to make this my declaration okay. of faith. Okay. So what's <laughs> wrong in saying it? it? It's it's one thing to say it, Are right? So was Moses. So was Jesus. Are you ashamed so was... to proclaim your faith? No, no but the, your 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 distinction is that that is you proclaiming your faith. You have to no, make this no, as part of your ritualistic practice. I'm not saying he's you want the to say only this messenger. that hey, you want to make a proclamation to the world that hey, Muhammad was a messenger of God. Go ahead. Okay, if you feel comfortable on the day of judgment when God asks, Hey, what was your shahada? You say, you did know I, what? La, 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 la. And you know, Muhammad was a messenger of God. It's like, okay, did I, cool. Did I say a lie or a truth? You did. Yeah, you did because he's not a messenger. I gave you nine points and you're stuck on one of them. I don't know why. You, if, right. if you're sincere, you would say, Okay, you gave me a lot of points. I got to think about this. I go right. research. Let's not make it about sincerity here. Can I say something? Uh, it's one thing to say, I believe. A messenger and and ultimately you have to believe he's a messenger just to believe the message like you can't be believing in hereafter and and and, and, and judgment day or whatever and you don't believe in a messenger the problem is a shirk association it's not about the distinction per se it's about associating another name with god while you're proclaiming your belief in god yeah but how inside you your prayer how, how is that association with god association is putting it beside it Okay, so if you're acknowledging other people or anyone in the middle of your prayer, that is something fully devoted to God. It's one thing to say, I believe uh, Muhammad is a messenger or Rashad is a messenger. That's a redundancy. If you're a believer, you ultimately believe in all the messengers and the prophet. I, I agree. It's, it's, it's a redundancy. But my point is that it's not idol worship and it's not shirk. That's my point. It's association for sure. For sure it's association. If he oh. wants to, he can go ahead. It's not a problem, right? You want to make that declaration part of your faith? Go ahead. You know, no one's stopping you. There's freedom of religion. It's interesting that you're, uh, you know, uh, attacking us for saying that, hey, we don't agree with that. I'm not attacking anyone. Did I attack anyone? I mean, it sounds like you're hostile towards this ideology. So oh, really? it's like, I'm just if you have a problem with it, that's fine. Yeah, exactly. You're arguing with it. You're not just like sharing. So let me just say humans. this. So, I don't know, man. Like I said, I mean, I gave you nine reasons. I wrote them down. I mean, I, I expect you to, like, actually read them and go through all the verses I put. Where are they? Where, where did you put them? I put it in VC1 chat, man. I mean, you asked a question. I've spent years studying this topic, and I gave oh, okay. you my honest answer. And so... so okay. Number one, obviously, Muhammad, how would he, why would he testify himself, like, so about himself so okay that that's the distinction among the messengers i think i addressed this one like it's not a distinction in in that matter because it's like when you recite like a surah from quran in which some messengers are mentioned and others are not you're already making a distinction so my point my belief is that you are not allowed to make a distinction among the messengers in a sense of their message of the that they brought of the way that they follow, they all follow the same path, the same religion. And if you say one, like there are different paths, that, that's making distinction among them. And there is, I think, a verse that explains it. I can look for it later if you want. Uh, Salat from Abraham. Uh, what does that have to do with uh, Shahada? Look, what all the messengers came. Navid? Uh, yeah, so this is so if you go to a traditionalist and you say that I'm doing my salat and in my salat I'm saying la ilaha illallah, and they would say, okay, what about the rest? Say, I don't want to say the rest, but say, okay, you're going to go to hell for that. You can't do that. You can't just say la ilaha illallah in the, in the Sunni. Okay, I, don't, I don't agree with that, so I can skip this point, right? But, but I don't get your point. So you're saying there's two different shahadas? Like, what, how does that make any sense? No, I'm saying, I'm saying, like the core shahada is, is go like just saying la ilaha illallah, 
But so like, you're saying there's a core shahada and there's like a side shahada? No, no, no. Listen, listen, like I'm not. I'm saying like if you say Muhammad Rasulullah, it's not wrong. You said truth. You didn't do no, anything no, wrong. Let it's me ask you something. Worship or anything, but I'm also saying it's not necessary. It's not. Do you know what this worship. reminds me of? This reminds me of like exactly. God's house. Hey, can I just can I just say something to Jamal? Brother, salam alaikum, Jamal. Oh, I like the, the, the grammatical, the 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 grammatic thing about when you say Muhammad Rasulullah is always uh, like if you're gonna say that in Arabic, it's gonna be wrong because you have to say Kana Rasulullah. Yeah, like was and you is. Can't... Is that the reason? Yeah. Present and the past yeah. tense. Still? Yeah. Yeah. But, like, exactly. Because if you because if you if you were at the present time of the Prophet, you would say he's the Rasulullah. I I agree, but like like now we're going into semantics. Do you agree? No, but I mean, even that's part of it. But what you're saying is basically shahadatain. Shahadatain means the uh, shahada. You witness two times. You witness two times. Yeah, you're, you say it two yeah, times. You're witnessing two different things. You're saying there's one main core shahada, and then there's an extra shahada that's optional. If you want to do it, it's okay. If you don't do it, it's okay. Like this is not a coherent logic. So what if? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Like I'm not. Saying, I'm just saying. Like. There's just not single one specific formula to do it. Like there is I, though. I, I like just God gave it to us. Abraham Shahada. So why don't we do Abraham Shahada? There's multiple proper ways to do Shahada, right? It's so just like there's pro uh, multiple uh, cows that uh, Jews could have sacrificed in order to fulfill God's command, but they just asked for more details and more details to be more for God to be more specific and more specific, like. God said, "Sacrifice cow. Any cow would suffice." God said, "Proclaim your shahada, oneness of God." Like, there are multiple ways to do it. Like, so show me multiple shahadas in the Quran, because uh, we no, showed you there's only one. I posted a little while ago, like shahada of uh, of Abraham, where he no, 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 where he adds like the I creator mean... of heavens and the earth, right, and no. stuff like that. So like, that's not as no. Not, but they're all dedicated like, to God alone. They don't. None of these mention any other entity beside God. I say there's no other God beside God. There's no other God beside Him. You right. know, there's so no other the, God except the most gracious, the most. These are all I the agree. same shahada. So did anyone? The concept anyone... is when we add another name and it's right. next to God's, right? That's what you're basically saying that hey, it's okay. It's right. okay. Did anyone say Muhammad is God or something? That, no, but or it's again four thirty six. Do not associate anything with God. Of course, not in, in God, in God, God, ship, God alone. In God ship. So you cannot associate anything in power in in, in any sort Even of. Even if I say that Muhammad is the servant of God, God I have to, if I have but to proclaim that every single time. Or a book, Hold on, guys, 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 guys. Let's okay. talk slower. Let's talk slower, softer, and not over each other. Let's talk, take turns. Go ahead, dude. Go ahead. We have to be absolutely content with the mention of God alone. If we're basically arguing to be able to mention any other entity, even if it's a servant of God, it just shows that we're not content with God alone. In essence, we're always looking for justification to say, you know, why can't I just, I just want to mention Muhammad's name. What's the big deal? It's just one entity. He's just the servant of God. Showing that on the day of judgment, God is going to say, what's your shahada? And are you still going to basically think that you care the slightest bit about Muhammad or any of God's prophets or messengers at that time? It says, we read the, the, the surah yesterday in surah 70. It says on day of judgment that they will give their own spouse, their children, their family, their tribe, everyone on earth. If it would spare them the retribution. You know, to think that this is going to distinguish us on the day of judgment by mentioning the name of Muhammad is utter nonsense. No, I, I agree. Like everyone should be content with mentioning God alone. Like just like what, what? but I'm saying like for people who just sometimes like occasionally they say Muhammad or so, I I think But Jamal, think about it. Think about this. We're standing in a line on the day of judgment, <laughs> everyone is there, and we're in front of God. What role is saying Muhammad Rasulullah gonna have in that event? Nothing. It has no function. It means nothing, right? I think even Muhammad's going to come to you and say, what are you talking about? We're all here. There's a billion of us or whatever, whatever number of us are here. We're present in front of God. And the only statement is la ilaha illallah. That's it. Hey. There's no mention of Muhammad. There's no, there's nobody. So I just talked to someone about this actually. Um, 
uh, traditional Muslim. And they said that the um, in Shahada saying that Muhammad is the la- is the last messenger or a messenger of God. They don't say that. Heard. They don't say that in the Shahada. They just uh, say last... he is a messenger. Yeah, they don't say he's the last messenger in the Shahada. Well, well some do. Yeah. No, they don't. No. No, they don't. They don't say Khatam Rasulullah. Uh, I don't know. I've watched some like Shahadas. Send actually. it to it. Dude, Send though. us the Shahada that says Muhammad is the last messenger. What they're saying is actually incorrect. The Shahada they have isn't in the Quran. And even if they're saying that that's what they're saying, which they're not, even that doesn't have basis in the Quran. Let me continue. Um, uh, so I was saying they're saying that in that, even if they just said like Muhammad is a messenger, right? That it is like the underlying meaning of that is accepting all the messengers before him, right? So they're saying it's like it's not making a distinction because it's inherently accepting all messengers. It's just a form of expressing that. So, but they're not saying, but they're not saying it literally. Yeah, they're not literally saying yeah. that. But like it's yeah. in essence accepting all that. In so the Quran, it's, it's said that he is like the the seal of all the other prophets. Mm. So, like, what is a seal? Seal of approval? Like, some, some, someone mm. sealed it and he approves all the, all of. Oh, the, no, 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 no. That's not what it means. That's, that so you're, you're, you're twisting the meaning is... of khatam. Huh? You're twisting the meaning of khatam. It means seal. What? You're twisting what the word means. That's not what it means. Can I just say something? Can I just say something? This argument, I, I'm familiar with this argument. This is really interesting argument. This is the argument that Baha'is use to justify the coming of Baha'u'llah with a new scripture. They say he is the seal of the prophet. It doesn't mean he's the final prophet. It just means that he basically affirms all the prophets. And they say that doesn't mean he's the final prophet. It doesn't mean Quran is the final scripture. Therefore, we have this other guy, Baha'u'llah, who is also a prophet, because Muhammad wasn't the last one. And look at his scripture, and look at our miracles, and look at our religion. And that's how they justify this entire new like sect of Islam, basically. Just it's a mistranslation of the verse. Go ahead. For clarification, like the, where, where this comes from seals, when you uh, would write, say, for instance, a letter, you would get a uh, uh, filament that you would basically um, melt down and you'd use it to seal to guarantee that only the recipient, when they get it, that it wasn't opened or tampered with. That's what it means when it says uh, 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 of the, 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 the prophets. In MBA, essence, he's MBA, the final MBA, scripture. MBA, yeah. No, but we have to also think about the, the other aspect. Uh, at, uh, when the Prophet is uh, making the Shahada, is he saying his own name or how do you see that, Jamal? Like, do you think, like, for example, if, if Muhammad uh, made the Shahada, do you think that he says Jesus, Rasulullah, kind of Rasulullah? Or how do you see that? What, what do you mean? What you mean? What was his Shahada? I mean, like, I mean, I mean, like every every prophet and messenger have been saying the shahada, no matter what, and like from that perspective, if you yeah, so the, probably then your thing, I live with your logic, then it means that the prophet Muhammad had to say the last messenger from the the other scripture, and he has to say Jesus. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, like there is no like one uh, specific form. Of shah of mm. shahada, there's an, like an essence of shahada, and there's like multiple versions of it. And saying it, like I can, like as I said, like there's shahada of Abraham. I posted it. It it's in form different, like the than la ilaha illallah. There's like a few more words there, and mm. like there's well, well, also shahada well, is of uh, Queen of Saba, mm. which is mentioned in Quran. It also has different word. It it she mentions uh, Solomon in her shahada. You can check it out in Quran. I don't know which verse it is. Mm. So my yeah, point bring, is, bring the verses to me. Bring the verses to me. Oh, oh, okay, I'm going to try to find it now. But you can keep on talking. Keep on talking because I want to listen to it. I can't uh, like uh, talk and... Okay, so... I, so I can't search and... Can I say you something? Can I, can I say something? All right. Go ahead. Go One ahead. Go ahead. I, I think I understand his issue because like, it's clear like the message has not changed. Every messenger God describes comes as a warner and bearer of good news. And the thing is, what you're trying to say is that after every prophet and messenger, the Shahada updated, essentially. Like, no, when it was Abraham, 
Abraham, I used to be Ashhadu an Abraham Rasulullah. I mean, no. and then Jesus, is, no, because what if, if, if we had prophets before Muhammad, no, like you still have to add that to the Shahada with that logic, right? No, no, my logic is uh, that Shahada doesn't have a strict form, there's an essence mm. of Shahada, which is to you mean in language, you, sorry, Jamal, it, you mean. Yeah? Sorry, Jamal, that I'm interrupted. I'm just mean like, you mean in language or what do you mean? Yeah, yeah, in language, has... in language, like, like it doesn't okay. have a strict form. Like you say, this, this specific words in this specific order, and the, like the, the mm. point is the essence. Mm. Like, what do you say? Yeah. The meaning of your shahada, and that you truly believe what you say. Like, okay. like, Jamal, I'm talking about the meaning. Think? Hypocrites can proclaim so shahada. What in the in the in the any yeah. form you want, but they cannot. They maybe mm. don't believe. They lie. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course, of course. But do you mean like, for an example, let's say we, when we look at the uh, the time of history, you know, the linguistic have been changing a lot. You know that. So no matter what you're saying, they're still saying that they're still saying if you transform it to La ilaha illallah, there is no God by God. No, can I just address a question? Can I just address yeah. a question? No, I just want to, can, hold on, can hold on. Just, so just wait, says, says, oh, God, no, but God. I want to hear. I want to hear what Jam I want to hear what Jamal is saying about that because it's interesting what he's saying. He's saying interesting well, like, stuff, said, but like, at the same time, different languages. Tell me, tell me, could, different languages could could have like different way, ways of saying it. Maybe you cannot say literally that in every other like language, but every mm. language requires shahada, right? Do you agree? Yeah, but the thing is, like, the essence of it is la ilaha illallah, no matter what, because all all of the scripture, all of the scripture, yes, the, when, when you are witnessing, you're gonna see that all the prophet says la ilaha illallah if you say it in Arabic, oh, and okay. if you want to translate Arabic, it in English, you... yeah, exactly, that's it. Okay, Navid, go ahead. <laughs> so I'm, I'm saying it's like if you go by the bare bones and just say that it's fine. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not denying it. Like, but I'm just saying, like, yeah. There are shahadas where where there there are other things, and I'm I'm gonna inshallah find those verses. So there yeah, isn't. Verses, yeah, there isn't. So this is the whole point I was making. It's like, what are we saying? We're saying that we should like. This, what, what I was gonna say is this sounds like um, like the Mohammedans who say, okay, so we have God's house in Mecca in the Kaaba, right, Masjid al Haram, and then also we have the sanctuary for Muhammad in Medina. So you can go there too. Um, and so it's like, why do we want to associate with our worship practices with other than God? This is the verse, I think Rod put it, 6162. I'm sorry to everybody for our bot being down. I don't know what's going on. But basically it says, uh, say my worship practices, uh, my prayers, my, what is it? Uh, comic prayers, my life and my death are all devoted absolutely to God alone, right? So it's like, you cannot... Add anything to your prayers that has any that is not God itself. You can't do that. It's not appropriate. And so, if we're saying that it's okay to say God alone in our then our in our um, shahada, then by default that means it's not okay to have a not God alone shahada. I mean, it can't both be right. You can't say well, they're both optional. Both it's not optional. Right. No, not in this regard. Not in this regard. You know, this is, sounds like, I'm sorry, but it kind of sounds like the Christians, when they talk about the Trinity, they say, yeah, well, no. we say God is one. They say, yeah, God is one, but also Jesus is a piece of God or Jesus is God in the flesh or Muhammad, something like that. Muhammad is servant of God and God's messenger. Is that a true or false statement? He was. And he was. God's yeah. He was, okay, yeah. He was. He was. Okay. Is that true or false statement? <laughs> so what are, so what are you going to say now? Canada, Sulullah. Let me answer this question also. Someone asked, what if we just mention all the prophets in our prayer? You so we the, know... You see, the, you see the, the Shahada of Queen of Sheba that I posted? 2744. It's not a Shahada. <laughs> I mean, you're really pulling at straws. It's not a Shahada. Why is it not a Shahada? She, I, shahada I submit. is a testimony of faith. So this is when she... No, it's not. Faith. Hold on, hold on. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So if I bear witness to someone committing adultery, can I say that in my prayer? That's a straw man argument. What, what does that no, mean? No, it's what not you because you, saying, you're yeah. grabbing any random instance of someone bearing witness and you're saying this is a shahada. Wait, wait, wait. But she's witnessing to God the first time. Like, this is when she became a believer. This is her, like, proclamation. 
This is not some random statement. Let me read the verse. 2744. Challenge Oh, our bodies back. SubhanAllah. Okay, it says, we, she was told, go inside the palace. When she saw its interior, uh, she thought it was a pool of water and she pulled up her dress, exposing her legs. He said, this, is, this interior is now paved with crystal. She said, my Lord, I have wronged my soul. I submit with Solomon to God, Lord of the universe. Wait, so what, how is this a shahada? What is the shahada? It's, a, it's her testimony of faith. No, it's not. You know, no, no, it's not shahada then. Shahada means bearing witness. She has to say, I bear witness. So she's not bearing witness. So again, you didn't meet the, your own criteria. So keep looking. But going back to the other question about the prophets, um, uh, if we want to, like, let's say there's 30 prophets. I mean, is it even practical at that point? You're going to mention 30 prophets? And it's not even prophets, though. Uh, so, Abdul Allah, it doesn't say prophets. It says among the messengers. And there's too many messengers. And we don't even know all the messengers. So, let's say there's 50 messengers that I know of. Does it make any, let's just say all the other rules that are being violated, let's just suspend them for a moment. And let's just focus on this one rule of just no distinction, right? So, then I'm going to say 50 messengers every time in my prayers. And that well, doesn't even you, include all the messengers I don't even know about. The, well, what if you don't thing. say their names per se? You just say, I bear witness that everyone mentioned in the scriptures is, is a messenger. That's the well, thing, like, I think, that's, I that's think Rod had a Muhammad good point in the VC chat. The says, then why not say that the Quran is in Arabic? You know, why not proclaim every single aspect of our faith and belief? Why not say, okay, and I believe that there's a hereafter and that you have to lead a righteous life. And, uh, you know, uh, just go down the list of all these facts that we know. What point do you stop? Like, this is the funny thing. Like, one side, you have very simplistic <laughs> that you bear witness there's no other God beside God. You, know, you only mention <laughs> the other side, you try to find every justification to expand on that. Why? No one, no one is saying that you're required to or that you need to or anything like that. The, like, debunking that is a strong man argument. Like, no one is arguing that. The argument is... Is it okay to say or not? Is it it's, again, it's a, or not? There's a difference between is, making a statement. Worship. There's a difference yeah. between making a statement and then making it your proclamation of faith. That's the difference. But you're talking about just general statements. Yeah, uh, was Prophet Muhammad the messenger of God? Absolutely. Of faith of Queen Let me finish. Sheba, and she Let, me finish. Let me finish. Okay. Do you think that this was every single time from then on out when the uh, Queen of Sheba was uh, testifying to her uh, devotion to God alone, she made the same statement repeatedly over and over and over and over again? No, that she course. started including this into her salat, that she started doing this in her commemoration? No. Again, you're the one who's creating these straw man arguments. Uh, we are trying know, to find though. every single justification to expand beyond the simple shahada that has been around since the dawn of time. So essentially, why to expand this beyond the simple uh, devotion to God alone? So, were you saying essentially, like it's okay to say these things? It's just like if you're making this a requirement in order to become Muslim, that's the problem. Is that fair? Yeah. Once it becomes a religious practice, you know, it's no longer. You know, we're not talking about like uh, who Muhammad was, what his message was. We're saying that look. In order to be part of this faith, you have to continuously, perpetually make this uh, proclamation, and you have to include it into your worship practices. When we're trying to say that it's like, oh, what's wrong with this simple statement? It's not just a statement. But people have made this into a pillar of faith for them. Again, a straw man argument. Like no one is. I'm not. Jamal, that everything that to argues be... against you is not a straw man argument. Not, did I ever say it, it's 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 a pillar of faith that it's requirement? I don't know why you bring keep bringing it up. I'm just keeping. No, it. but you're missing the point. So, okay, we are saying it is a pillar, right? We're saying this is the pillar. Pillar one is the shahada. We're saying this is the pillar. You're saying it's optional to modify wait, this pillar. Wait, that's what you're it, saying. Is it uh, or is it just la ilaha illallah? It's all the same. The aspect is it's the devotion to God there alone. You, go. you can say a multitude of ways. That's what I'm saying. No, 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 so no, no. You're, no, no. you're, you're trying to so say you want to include so another on. entity in this declaration other than God. Let me clarify this. So saying la ilaha illallah is a statement of fact. It's not a shahada. Shahada means testimony. When I say ashadu an la ilaha illallah, I'm saying I bear witness. I'm saying I'm testifying to this. So when we're saying that we bear witness. That is the statement. That's just what it is. 
If I say mm-hmm. la ilaha illallah, that's not me bearing witness to anything. That's just saying, stating a fact. So you're saying it's not a fact that uh, Muhammad is Rasulullah, even though Allah says in the Quran, He's not. Allah, he's not. So you're saying no, it's 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 not Canada, so, yeah, it's so you're Canada. Yes, Canada. So Allah. you're not trusting your Lord, huh? No, 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 it's Canada. Even God calls him Canada, Rasulullah. Wallahu ya'lamu in Surah Munafikun. Read it. That's the hip, the, the hypocrites' declaration. <laughs> no, it says Al no. ya'lamu. God, God knows. So, in God, so are we? Okay, so okay, so that's for that time. So he's dead now. So do you believe he's currently a messenger? Th- that's that's not like uh, that's not the point of this discussion. It is. It is a point, though. I mean, we're looking at this. This is what so we're you're doing. Saying, you're bringing us a proposal. Hold on, hold on. You're bringing us a proposal. We're looking at it from every single dimension. I gave you nine dimensions. Now we're focusing on this grammatical one. I'm saying it's even wrong with just if we look at it purely grammatical. It's wrong for all of these reasons, but it's definitely wrong for each one independ- independently. And you're so saying that... I, could say, doesn't, I mean, what, what are I you could, saying right I now? Could, I could make an argument that he is. Want me to prove it? That Muhammad is currently a messenger, but all the other messengers are not currently messengers. Yes, please no. prove it, please. No, no, it's it, it doesn't. It say in uh, in Quran that uh, do not say to the ones who have died, uh, fighting for the cause of good, that they are dead. No, they are they are alive, but you don't know. No, no, that's not what the verse says. It says they are alive at their Lord. And just so everyone knows, no, 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 they are this alive. Is, hold on a second. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, at their Lord, not on earth. It never says they're alive on earth. Alive. But hold on, hold on. I just want to make a clarification for everyone because I just made this mistake right now. Just so everyone knows, if you're not looking at the VC, this is not Jamal speaking. This is his brother. They have very similar voices. So I just want you to be careful if you're judging Jamal based on what his brother's saying. That's not righteous. We have to hold everyone accountable for what they're saying themselves. So I just made this mistake, and I apologize to Jamal. Um, but yeah, so um, I don't hear that they have they have different voices. To be honest, I don't know. I feel like I feel like I I, I heard the same voice. I just thought I was talking with Jamal. But salam alaikum, Ellen Dira. It's nice to yeah, meet you because I know you. But yeah, the, the point is like, it is true that he is the Rasul of God. Because God, but he's says, not though. Move. No, he's not though. It's, so going he back is, to the point, he's alive. No, God no, no, says, it says Quran. He, he, I know that you are Rasul. So if God says we are, He knows He is, he is Rasul. At that time, if we believe in God. Then we either say that we believe in God. So I have a question. So then, why are why are all the other prophets and messengers mentioned in the past tense? So the but you're saying is, since God is. Hold on, let me finish this point. All the prophets and messengers are mentioned in the past tense. And then when it talks to Muhammad, let's just say there's a couple instances where it refers to him a present tense when it's talking to him. Like, you are God's messenger or something like that. You're saying that when he died, his death is different than all the other prophets and messengers because no, his, his life is perpetual. And up to this day, we can still no, say he saying. is a messenger of God, but I can't say Jesus is a messenger of God. You can say, yeah, you can say that. So you say Jesus is a messenger of God? Yes, of course. Well, how come God talks about him in the past tense? He, it's his will. He can do whatever yeah, he wants. I'm not following your logic here. I don't think it's coherent. It's but, okay. God can do whatever he wants. Like, but it's up to us to. But that's God. God. We don't. We don't. We shouldn't like debate uh, semantics here, ling- linguistics. Like, we need to debate like the essence of things. I think, because even Quran itself uses like uh, other tenses like past, past or present for like future events and vice versa right agree with a new iconoclasm can we move on to some other topic i feel like uh has been early uh discussed yeah but please the reason why why muhammad because he's the last and he just confirms everything that was before him so in order to like not have to repeat every single name of every prophet that came before you just say Muhammad Rasulullah and you're confirming everyone that came before him because he's the last and that's it. Rasul means messenger. So the last Rasul is actually Rashad Khalifa. So by this logic, we should be saying he's Rashad not. Rasulullah. Yeah, but I don't believe that he's a messenger of God. So, oh, okay. Then what, do you what have are we any talking other, about uh, here? Questions or... oh, I was just wondering, like, could you guys go over like why someone should believe in the Quran in general? 
Or did is that? Did you read Quran, Abdullah? Did you read translation of Quran yourself? Uh, yeah, I've read from Anis, like one through four, and then thirty to one fourteen. Yeah. Yep. I think nothing we say will like reassure you better than than if you take the book yourself and just read it, like from the beginning to the end. Because like, it's has good stuff in it, right? But it's like. What? Why would that make it like the word of God per se versus just any other like self help book out there? You know what I mean? Like, you see what I mean? Like, there's a difference between something being good versus being the word of God. So, like, how do you make that distinction? Uh, there's a, think, yeah, at there's some a, point, you just feel it. There's a claim in the Quran. It says, if if there's a book with better guidance, uh, please show it so I can uphold it. Right. Uh, the aspect is it's like this is a book that's been around for 1400 years uh, it tells us all the details of our uh, what we need to do in order to make it into the hereafter and have salvation uh, it's packed with uh, you know uh, prophecies and scientific findings that again 1400 years ago there's no way they could have known and today we're still trying you know uh, uh, unlocking in addition it has a mathematical structure is beyond the uh, capability uh, of anyone, especially at that time, to be able to uh, reproduce, unless it was deliberately designed, you know, from the get-go. But it's a fact that for 1,400 years, this information was embedded inside the Quran, uh, and only, you know, relatively recently was this unlocked. You know, if you if there's another book that meets all this criteria, that provides better guidance, you know, then please show it. Why is that your criteria? I mean, that's the criteria set in the Quran. Isn't that kind of a circular day, argument, mean, though? That? Isn't that kind of a circular argument, though? It's like the Quran says it's the criteria there. I need, I need to put the Quran no. to this criteria. I mean, it, the, the simple fact is, do you have a book with better guidance? That's the criteria say. that God says. Is, look, this is the best book, and if you have a book with better guidance, then please present it. Well, how do you determine what's the best guidance, though? Like, what's your measurement? <laughs> I feel like some of the, uh, the the data points I just brought up is uh, enough that you could spend, you know, uh, volumes uh, discussing. So the mathematical miracle and the scientific scientific miracles, is that... You've that's... got the mathematical miracle, you have the scientific miracle, you have the linguistic excellence, you have the preservation of the, uh, the, 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 the scripture, you have the uh, absolute devotion to God alone. Um, you know, these things, they all compound one uh, on top of one another. You know, show me one self-help book that has any of this. But that tomorrow we're not going to read and be like, oh, well, that was, uh, you know, scientifically flawed. Oh, that was wrong. Okay, we have a misunderstanding here. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. All right. Cool. Is there any, like... Because, I mean, obviously you can read the Quran yourself, but, like, is there any, like, good things that kind of, like, just go over all these different proofs? Like, any book or anything you'd recommend? I have something. It's called Appendix 1. I really highly suggest you uh, read it. I think I've shared it with you in the past. Uh, this is Appendix 1. I think you should devote uh, your time to just reading Quran itself. Yeah, but well, reading Quran is not proof. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, like, proving doesn't have much to do with it. Like, God, like, God willing, if when you read it, like, if God wills, he will guide you. He will reveal the, the meanings of Quran to you. So, like, if you just read the book with understanding, with honest approach, and if you reflect upon the verses and the meanings, and then if you have some doubts or questions, you can ask others. Okay. I think like uh, your first hand experience with the revelation of God, the book itself is the, the best, like that's the primary source. Uh, everything else, like you, you can expand that all, the, all your knowledge, like afterwards, after you finish the Quran. Okay. If it, in it, you have to like add it up to the previous scripture though, right? If you're going to follow the Quran teaches, right? It has to confirm the previous scripture, right? So like, you have to compare it to the truth presented in the previous scriptures, you know? 
No. So I just put I just put two verses for you. I don't necessarily agree with what Jamal said. I believe it says in the Quran, chapter seventy four, verse thirty, it says over is nineteen, and then it gives five reasons for number nineteen. I put four of them. Two are directly related to Christians. If you believe that you were Christian at one point in time, number two, it says the number nineteen. The purpose is to convince Christians and Jews that this is a divine scripture. Number four, it says. To remove all traces of doubt from the hearts of the Christians, Jews, as well as the believers. So number 19 does serve this function in the Quran. And so um, this is how you do it. Because like you said, there's like a million different books. There's self-help books. There's this, there's that. But if you believe in God, then this is the mechanism God is saying, this is how you're going to remove all your doubt. And maybe you can try other ways. Maybe there's all kinds of theories about how you're going to re remove doubt or learn this is the word of God. But I'm using a theory. I'm not using a theory. I'm using the methodology and the proposition that God himself is giving us in the scripture. I think it's appropriate to present this as such. Huh. But like, shouldn't you like work from like something we can all agree on rather than like the Quran itself as like a means for determining if it's true? Like, you see the issue there? It's like, I don't know, I'm trying to think. Or yeah, do you see the issue there? I don't. I don't understand your question. What's your question again? So, shouldn't we work on? Shouldn't we use like something that we can all agree is true, right? Or something like yeah. That, that's that's what mathematics is. I mean, that's why we have to have a right. So let me. I'm, I'm sorry to throw your like your former religion under the bus, but if a bunch of people, the missionaries, come to my house and say, "Well, you should believe in our religion," Joseph Smith performed all these miracles. It's like, well, David, you're I haven't. Right. Yeah, I turned it off. I said. Uh, I haven't seen Joseph Smith. I can't verify those miracles. So that's not anything I can agree on, right? So I'm showing you evidence that you can analyze right now. You can tell me about your, like, for example, the Mormon prophets, what they supposedly did. Baha'is can tell me that their prophet did miracles. The uh, Ahmadiyyas can tell me their prophet performed miracles. There's nothing for me to agree, like, witness in that regard in any of these claims. But well, regarding Code 19, you can witness it today. You can witness it right now. You can test it. You can study it. If you have anything like this from any other religion, I'd love to see it because I've been searching a very long time and I haven't seen it. The only thing I've seen is this miracle from God, the ultimate miracle. Okay. You got uh, a verse to, this is a 364. It says, say, O followers of the scripture, let us come to a logical agreement between us and you. We shall not worship except God, that we never set up any idols beside him nor set up any human beings as lords beside God. If they turn away, say, uh, bear witness that we are submitters. Um, could I say something? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, for me, I think that uh, the, the message itself is, is, uh, is uh, proof for me that it's divine because it doesn't... Uh, claim superiority or exclusion to other divine scriptures it's uh, inclusive so a few a lot of religions they basically say our prophet or our book is the last quran confirms previous scriptures and says one of the same message of all time it's a continuation of god sending messages to humanity and as uh, you know as peter mentioned there's no nonsense or contradictions if it's man-made somebody who is uh, studying it intensively will find these contradictions or flaws because human beings are flawed and god is not so god is challenging the humanity keep looking at this book try to find any kind of contradictions and even beyond that he puts the mathematical structure to uh, show even more proof for people but one of the things that is in the core of it all the quran claims that you don't even need uh, the quran to go to heaven there's a minimum criteria for anybody to go to heaven you believe in god believe in the last day and you lead a righteous life and this is universal but God, out of his mercy, sent these scriptures to make it even easier for us. You know, be what, whatever your scripture was at what time. But the Quran is a consolidated version of all of that. That is a gift to humanity, not a burden. So if you're looking at that aspect, that there's just three minimum criteria to be a submitter. And, it's, and it, um, claim, it calls for unity and brotherhood among, you know, everyone in humanity. And not an ex, ex, like a sect type of... Uh, um, like fundamental force behind the religion is basically this is the one religion that's always been. If there's one God, and I believe there is, the monotheism is the most logical approach of how 
the universe was created, there's always been one religion, and that's what it advocates. And for me, that's divine proof. Because I think the what's true, it speaks to people, that it makes more sense than anything else. That's all. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. So, but like, why, why focus on just the Quran, though? Like, is it because of your personal experiences of how it's like touched you that like you've that have brought you to it and like what keep you to it like versus like i don't know because i feel like like i understand like this is your anchor right you're like i gotta follow what the quran says but it's like why make that like your foundation versus like any other scripture right because like let's say i'm born in india right and i make hindu scripture my anchor right and like i follow that and it says for me to let's say it says don't believe in any other scripture except the hindu scripture right and like that's going to keep me in that and like that's just as equally a valid right um you know stan says like what you guys have with the quran no like see what i mean like you see the issue there uh, I'll add it's two things to Rod's earlier point, right? The you could be a believer and make it to uh, paradise without the Quran. You know, the aspect is this is an answer book that's going to make your life that much better and give you guaranteed salvation in the hereafter. You would want to, in essence, uh, uh, embrace what the uh, this book is uh, uh, telling you. Um, that said, you know, God tells us in 548 says, we have revealed to you this scripture truthfully confirming previous scriptures and superseding them. So the concept of the Quran is that this doesn't only confirm, but it supersedes because there are certain elements, and we, we talk about it during the Quran study, that if you read the Bible, it's going to give you the wrong depiction. You know, a clear-cut example is in the Bible, they say that, oh, Aaron was the one who basically formed the uh, golden calf and led the uh, children of Israel to worship it. See that that's not true according to the Quran, because you, know, you can imagine someone who's reading that and saying, "Whoa, God's prophet did such a thing!" Like it's it's one of those things. It's it gives you real kind of doubt and confusion. Then regarding how do we know the Quran? Again, this touches on Navid's point. Like the mathematical structure is no different than the miracles of the uh, the the past. How did the people know that what Moses brought was from God? You know, they saw the miracles, and that gave them kind of a, a guidance that, okay, what this guy is saying is not from this world, you know, that God, in essence, has revealed certain information to him. It makes them take heed. Same thing for Jesus. You know, by God's leave, Jesus does these miracles. You know, the miracles is not what's going to save someone. All the miracles do is allow the people to have some confidence that what this person is saying is divinely inspired. And the, the mathematical miracle does the same thing because I was in the same boat in college. I was like, dude, how do I know that this Quran is legit? How, why not the Bible? Why not the uh, the the uh, Vedas? Why not you know all these other uh, scriptures or uh, faiths that are out there? Once I studied the mathematical miracle of the Quran, I say, okay, dude, this is divine. You know, this is not something that in essence is uh, uh, you know uh, it it does exactly what it claims. It removes that doubt. On top of that, it also guarantees that the, the message we're reading today, the unadulterated, you know, untampered message that was given originally to the Prophet 1400 years ago. You just don't have that level of certainty with any other uh, scripture that's out there. Hmm. And you say you don't feel like you need to investigate that to know that? Or investigate like these other scriptures in order to know that like no they... i mean i i spent uh, six months studying the uh the the mathematical miracle itself before i accepted it you know fully accepted it uh, i've spent tons of you know years studying some of the other uh, scriptures and stuff but again it doesn't compare to what i find in the quran that's why that claim in the quran says look if there is a book with better guidance from god uh, then please you know show it so i can follow it uh, the aspect is out of all the scriptures that I've studied, you know, out of all the research I've done, this is the one that I find to be the absolute most solid, uh, you know, for those reasons stated. Hmm. <laughs> to, to, like, tr uh, grow yourself to be a strict monotheist and, you know, a, uh, without having to go through the trial of error and, you know, figuring out how, what things work to, you know, you know, find happiness in this world, the Quran makes it that much easier. So, it's a it's a gift to have these things because rather than having to uh, you know figure out a lot of things on our own, you know, God has made it easy for us. That's the way I look at it. Hmm. Okay. To 
you feel like the Quran is like the quickest way, like the most efficient? It's like um, it's like you try to go to school without taking like going like trying to learn a university level um, like information without having like a, a mentor, instructors, or textbook things like that. It just makes it more difficult because like people before the writing existed, that concept of monotheism existed, and it's always been an instinct in us. But, um, you know, in the Quran, it talks about how humanity demanded these things and God out of his mercy gave it to us. We, they wanted a scripture. They wanted messengers. They wanted someone to confirm things. And God sent it to, to us, you know, to make it that much easier to make this, uh, you know, this world is like an education to learn to appreciate God once again. And a lot of people, they have a hard time doing it. And God's giving us every excuse to make it. Making it very easy for us to become strict monotheists and appreciate, appreciate God and not... Uh, you know, appreciate something else, or we, we have to love, learn to love God out of our own volition. That's the essence for me in the Quran, and to respect his laws and accept it. A submitter is someone who submits to the authority of God willingly, and they're happy about it. That's the essence. So this is what, when you read the Quran, you learn about this, and you learn about the laws that God set in this world, and you appreciate that. Thanks for the thorough answer, guys. Appreciate it.